Good evening, everybody. My name is Cameron, and welcome back to the bar. I've got my pal, Eric, who's joining me again. He was gracious enough to bring in this book from David Wondrich. It's called Imbibe. A little look at the cover. There's the decal in the background and whatnot. This week has been rather hectic so far. Things have been kind of, kind of cool throughout the week and whatnot. And uh, it seems that uh, I think the only thing, the thing that I think I need properly for everything is just a nice classic cocktail. Something a little short to kind of rein in through the rest of the week. How has your week been so far? It's been a long week, to be yeah. honest. And it's not even halfway done yet. Oh so. my gosh. <laughs> the fact that Wednesdays are the time that we do these things is like right smack in the middle of the week. Yeah. On the bright side, I'd consider this to be like a, like a kind of a an effort high. And then for the rest of the week, it can be a little chill. On the uh, on the plus side, though, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the cocktails out of this book are very strong. Perfect. So we're gonna have a, a good time making these. Perfect, indeed, <laughs> indeed. As we've been kind of, as you all noticed last week as well, I had a couple of people behind the bar, and I've just kind of been in that feeling to really like bring people more behind the bar. It feels a lot more like pleasant to have people here. So you're not like bartending alone or drinking alone. It's a whole, it's a whole like wonderful thing. Here, step forward a little bit more. I just noticed my lights are not oh, there really catching you. Yeah, that's perfect. Better. You're kind of like in the in the darkness back here. Just kind of try to hide in the shadows yeah it's that side of the bar it's a little it's the dark side versus the, the lighter side which has all the fun <laughs> ingredients you, and you utensils. <laughs> so so what do we got in store for us this evening yeah so we're gonna be going through several recipes out of imbibe uh which is an amazing book by david wondrich um the last time i was on the stream which is for the the uh for the charity stream for the charity stream yeah 24 hour stream uh, we went through a couple of recipes out of Punch, which is one of David Wondrich's other books. Mm -hmm. um, that book focuses a lot more on the history of Punch. Uh, you guys saw us make the Philadelphia Fish, Fish House, House Punch. punch. Uh, I know Cameron and company drank that for like several weeks afterwards. Because it kept it in the so fridge much. so well. And I would say, dare, dare I even say, it actually tasted better like a yeah. week after we made it. I was, I was telling him before that um, I made that Fish House Punch for New Year's a few years ago. And uh, I didn't know, that's the first time I ever made it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how many, how much it made. Mm -hmm. And I only had like five people over and it made like a pop like that big. So because much of this. Cause I think remember we didn't stream, even do the full, yeah. we didn't even we do did the a full half, thing. We did a half recipe on the stream. <laughs> so I made a full recipe. And so I have way too much left over. So I bottled a lot of it mm -hmm. and just put it away. Cause it, it oh, keeps, yeah. it's, it's alcoholic enough that it, it just kind of keeps it on its own. Spoil. Yeah. And uh, the punches actually age, which is kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, I remember you telling me about that. Yeah, so over the year, we we opened up a few of those bottles and drank them, and they actually got like better, like you said, over time. So mm -hmm. it's kind of fascinating yeah. how those uh, how those drinks work uh, over a, over a period of time. But oh, for sure, yeah. Um, that first book of his, uh, David Wonders, for if you guys don't know, he is a cocktail historian. Um, so he has done a ton of research um, into he's the development. Yeah, he, he's a yeah. he's a wild looking guy too. He's he has a, a really a really nice beard and goatee. Check out, check out this, check out this yeah, guy. see if you can get that in there. Here. He's a, he's a good looking guy. What a guy! Um, he also is on the uh, the most common uh, orange bitters uh, that you can buy. He's on the bottle for it. Oh, is he really? Yeah, because he he was the one that kind of got orange that's bitters not, to be popular. I guess Angus Thor isn't. Yeah, so it's not Angus Thor. It's, it's not Angus Thor. It's got to be a different one, it's, right? Yeah, it's Regan's Regan's, Regan's orange bitter. bitter. So that was the first big orange bitters that was released because of this book because there's a lot of ingredient and we'll talk about this in a little bit but there's mm -hmm. a lot of ingredients in this book that used to be very difficult to get when it, this was published back in about 2007 ish mm -hmm. um and back then there was a lot of ingredients which we'll talk about that were like impossible to find oh yeah and he actually uh started moving the momentum to getting more people to use these old ingredients mm -hmm. in in and were some cocktails. of the some of the older ingredients things like let's say like maraschino or like absinthe and stuff or uh, rye whiskey so or? it was it was I'm like just guessing here it would have been like it was like specific rums mm -hmm. um oh like the like jamaican like rums jamaican, or yeah like, Jama uh, Smith, i know he's messing smith and cross yeah, in here smith a lot and cross. Yeah, so Smith and Cross was actually a brand that he helped prop up. With oh, that's stuff. cool, actually. So, yeah, so that we'll we'll talk about that more as we go through. Yeah, but there's it's there's, really there's a it, lot of great stuff. It's in there. really interesting to think like I for some reason hold like imbibe in particular imbibe and punch in this episode in this area of my mind where I feel like it's a lot older a book than it actually is. Like you, when I asked you earlier, like when this book was from, it was like oh 2007. And I was like, really? Like yeah. I thought for some reason that this was a much older book, and I think it's just because like the cover kind of fools you there. It looks like an older book than it actually should. Yeah, be. and I think they I think they updated it like ten years ago or something. Yeah, I think so I found a couple of different covers out there for yeah. it. So, anyways, it's um it's a it's a book on the history of cocktails. Mm -hmm. So it starts at the very beginning with punches, and he has a short section about punch in this book because he has this whole other book 
on punch oh yeah um and then the book moves through the chronology of the development of cocktails over time so mm -hmm. it uh it introduces uh flips different egg drinks different shaken drinks uh in between uh the sort of civil war era and prohibition yeah when prohibition yeah. comes around that's where the cocktails get big yeah yeah um so that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight actually we're gonna be doing a bit of a chronological journey through this book away from here um as as cameron had mentioned previously and we're gonna yeah. kind of talk about uh we're not gonna talk about the full development of the cocktail and like the history of the cocktail but we're gonna kind of have a little a couple fun spots we'll talk about this yeah book, we'll play around this, with it. this book has so much information in it like more than you ever thought you need to know a whole about a martini. 330 pages of everything you could possibly yeah. <laughs> want to know about cocktails from apparently the beginning how they used to do it starting in the 1783s all the way to i suppose 2007. yeah 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 and it's the another really interesting part of the book and i think we'll talk about this in the first recipe that we get into but they have um the older recipes used to use really odd measurements for things. And so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Oh, yeah, through, we'll, we'll dive into it. Yeah. So I see a couple of people popping out there so far. Imicho is hanging around. She was actually on the stream last week while we were doing a spicy, it was a spicy spirit stream. Oh, nice. So we essentially took a bunch of things leading up to a Carolina <laughs> Reaper vodka bottle, Oof. which actually wasn't that spicy at all. I was actually very disappointed by it. However, we did have jalapeno, habanero, fresno, and serrano tinctures there with vodka and mezcal and stuff. And my stomach was not really feeling it. But anyways, <laughs> anyways, I think that's that's kind of leading into this week. I need a little bit more of that hair of the dog to kind of recover back from that as we lead ourselves into like the latter half of, uh, I guess, uh, February and stuff. All right, so imbibe, just to read the full cover for those who aren't initiated in this, imbibe, expelled with the exclamation point, from absinthe cocktail to whiskey smash, a salute in stories and drinks to Professor Jerry Thomas, pioneer of the American bar. And Jerry Thomas was another like actual like cocktail, like cocktail bartender who I think perpetuated a lot of the drinks that we kind of see in the book, right? Yeah. David Wonders being more the historian covering kind of where, I guess Jerry Thomas has left his mark and other famous bartenders as well, I assume. Yeah, so Jer Jerry Thomas Thomas was like one of the first big, like well-known bartenders back in the, in the mid 1800s. I think Jerry, does Jerry, oh wait, I was gonna say, I thought Jerry Thomas had like, um, had like a book that has like the, uh, the classic image of like the bartender like pouring up from way up here. But I noticed that that's the front of this book has that. Yes. That's, so I might just be that thinking just of like a bigger, <laughs> uh, earlier iteration of no, this Jer book. No, Jerry Thomas was um, one of the first bartenders to like write out the recipes and like try to codify the, like the, the process. Really? Of okay. So the bartending existed a lot within that period of time, like around like antebellum. Oh yeah. Uh, America. Yeah. Um, before the Civil War, let's talk about this for just a sec, because I sure, think yeah. this is where our first drink will come in. So we'll the, the, the brief commentary on punches, right? Yeah. So, so punches were um, for a very long time, like you go all the way back to the 1500s. That was the primary way that people had alcoholic beverages, um, aside from just having wine. Because Large wine, batches wine's always of around. cocktail. Exactly. Punches. Yeah, so you'd either have like cognac or brandy by itself is like one drink that they used to have all the time. Mm. Wine, wine's always been around for forever. Oh, yeah. Um, but in terms of a mixed drink, what they would do is similar to what we did on our stream we, you get a big bowl you make a very large batch batch of a mm. very uh acidic drink so there's a lot, a lot of citric of acid citrus and stuff in um, there so that, yeah you have like lemons and limes um there's a lot of sugar in oh yeah as, as i think you, we i recall seen. we added like a bunch of sugar to it i'm pretty sure oh yeah it's in in the smaller in the smaller recipe we made mm. which it still had like almost a cup of sugar in oh it, my so. gosh yeah yeah and then um and then and then you add your spirit yeah. and then the idea with that is you have your big bowl and you can scoop you know a, the a drink out for everybody. oh yeah 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 it's a very communal type of activity very so much is that especially was, if you have a punch bowl big enough to actually serve all of the people there right so that was very big all the way up until about antebellum uh America. Mm -hmm. uh, and Can you remind us around like what year or century the antebellum was? Uh, that would be like 1820s to like the Civil War. Nice. So, you know, nice. 1820, 1860. You yeah. can just say like early, early 1800s. You can oh, think. yeah. Like first half of the 19th century. Um, and interestingly, um, one of the reasons that punches started to fall out of favor was because the types of alcohols that were primarily made in the United States. A lot of brandies and well, cognacs and stuff, well, right? Or? No, it's more like whiskey. Right? Oh, so, oh, okay. Yeah, like I keep thinking like apple, like Applejack and stuff a early on. Apple, Applejack's also a whiskey though, basically, right? It's mm, made, okay. Like I, I don't, a, Applejack's not really a brandy because it's, mm. it's a lot stronger alcohol. Yeah, yeah. So you have like Applejack and, and whiskey are like the primary two big 
mm. and then gin also was pretty big interesting um, in the united states and, i honestly know none of those... nothing about it, especially when it comes to like the more historical aspect of like spirits and whatnot i have absolutely no visibility on yeah so this and, is actually quite fascinating. yeah none, none of those really go into punches very well mm. so there was a push in that period of time to start making some more single serving drinks mm -hmm. um with these Smaller stuff right with with these more powerful because like brandy and cognac are not as strong as like whiskey and stuff is yeah right? so yeah that you needed to make smaller drinks so people wouldn't get blitzed you know, <laughs> drinking drinking totally big communal drinks and even flipping through some of the recipes that we're going over this evening it seems that a lot of them there so this book is kind of styled in such a way that they kind of give the uh david wonders gives like the original ratios for the cocktail as it would be found like in the, I guess, the history books and stuff and then like kind of a um a different interpretation something that's a little more balanced especially in terms of a lot of the higher proof yeah. spirits that's going in so here. he he really likes to talk about the um the verbatim you know what was written in like the 1860 something recipe right yeah, he actually yeah. puts that in the book and then under it he's like this sucks like don't do this <laughs> like because like this is not like at least by today's alcohol standards like back then sure. there was there also yeah. was not any um regulation on yeah. alcohol back then in terms of like its production like now there's fda and, and other groups that for sure yeah i feel like back then like now like you you'd buy the same let's say like brand from the store but it wouldn't necessarily be the exact same like let's say taste or spirit or whatever i yeah. feel like it relied a lot more on let's say like a particular vintage almost like a wine for example there's such distinction even between a particular varietal or brand and so in, now. E in each of these recipes he tries really hard to replicate the flavor profile of what it would have been back then so mm. like uh, one example i can think off the top of my head the Plymouth gin variety, which is something we kind of have a version of that we'll use in the recipe tonight. Um, most everybody that's mm. had gin is used to like a L London dry, L London dry gin, which is very junipery, mm -hmm. right? Plymouth gin is less junipery. Yeah. Um, and that gin did not exist until he print he published this book. Really? Because it got people to start using that older style of mm -hmm. old Thomas. Oh, because I guess so. I guess like the it was a more popular style way back then, and it kind of completely fell out of style. And he brought it back, and just like, well, actually, yeah. this is the kind of gin you want to be using. Another here. another really good example um, that I just thought of. Yeah. Um, orange curacao. Yeah. So oh my gosh, if if anybody's ever been to the islands of curacao, mm -hmm. that's it's Never. a <laughs> very very popular drink there. But mm -hmm. orange curacao, um, it's kind of similar to uh, Grand Marnier. Yeah. The, but very, it's, very orangey. Yeah, but super orangey, but it's really bitter. So yeah. like Grand Marnier is not as bitter. Never um, actually had Grand Marnier before, but I remember even trying to look for, I think there was a dry curacao for a recipe like weeks ago or whatever. Yeah. And the closest thing I could find was, I think someone from Chile, I believe. So I, I should have bought, I, I have a bottle of dry curacao at home. Oh yeah? That I found Ooh, and it. It was another one actually that he, it was a brand he released. No kidding. But it's interesting because in a lot of these older recipes, that was a really common ingredient that disappeared because people stopped liking those cocktails. Interesting. Nobody made it until like 20 like well i noticed too like in the, even the books that i have over there like it's only the, the older ones that even mention dry curacao specifically and so yeah. for all the longest time even like during the beginning of my own like bartender like like mixologically and stuff and whatnot i'd just be like well dry curacao orange curacao can't be that different than blue curacao i couldn't be more than wrong Amy Chow's like, I've been, I've been so good to Curacao. Yeah. Cool. It's, I actually have been to the island before. It's it's pretty amazing. It's like do more traveling. Highly, highly recommended island to go to. It's very close to the coast of Venezuela, though. So yeah. It's something you have to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> but um to, to finish this this comment before we start on the totally. rest of this, um, there are a lot of ingredients that used to be used back in the day that taste different now. Mm -hmm. And so he tries to make an effort to get it to taste as similar to the original version as possible with the ingredients we currently have. Mm -hmm. So in some circumstances, that means we have to substitute things out. Yeah, um, yeah. I know like there's a, there's one recipe in there where he, he wants peach brandy, which um, when he wrote the book, what didn't exist too much actually. Now yeah. there's a lot more peach, peach brandy, kind of like the like the kind of a stuff that we used for the punch recipe, yeah, with something it, a little more like I guess brandy I forward think, as opposed to the peach. I think a heavier a heavier one because that yeah, was like that I was kind of cheap. Peach yeah, brandy. yeah, yeah. But still got I, some I think that, we need. I think that was brandy with like literally like peach flavoring, it, it as opposed to, to like brandy that was brewed with the yeah. Or, uh, and it's interesting that like with the peaches. as you dive deeper into some of these like I guess more classic cocktails and stuff, you find that like when you see like let's say like an apple brandy or a peach brandy, it's not necessarily something that just like straight up tastes like peach. Like there's right. a lot more nuance to the flavor there because you're combining with something like very very complex, like let's say like a rye whiskey or like a gin, and you, you know if you have something that's super fruit overpowery, it's like it's kind of hard to appreciate ever all the interplay. It goes on yeah there. so I, I know there's some recipes in there where he'll say like hey if you don't have this you can mix these other two more yeah. common things and it tastes pretty close to what it would have tasted nice. like 
so, cool stuff. So that's kind of the, the, the path that we'll go. Um, a lot of, I've only ever had one of these cocktails out of this book before that we're going to be making tonight. So this is going to be a little, a little Ooh, bit of an experience. I love it. I love it. I love it. We're going to, we're going to be trying it on stream. I know there was one I had, I've had like, I've made like maybe four or five out of this book. Mm -hmm. um, two of them I remember making, they were like horrendously bad. Cool. But like I, the way that, the, like the way that David put forth, no, like this no, little trailer. No, like the, the original. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, gotcha. I, I learned at that point, always follow David's direction he is the it. oracle yeah. follow david's <laughs> advice if you want a good um, drink so anyways uh should we go ahead and get started i'd love to all right so we are going to start at the beginning of our sort of cocktail chronological journey here imagine yourself taking it way back back before you were even born back to insert year wee, wee. Or, uh 1863 1863 <laughs> if you have a proper reference for that just like just like kind of like sit yourself there right in the middle right in the Pop middle of the civil pride. war so <laughs> So we were talking about punches, uh, and we're going to make a punch mm -hmm. for our first drink, but we're not going to be making a big bowl. We're going to be making a single serving punch. Small little cocktail sizes. And uh, an interesting thing about punches um, that I think we talked about on the stream last time mm -hmm. is uh, a lot of institutions and like clubs um, have their own yeah. punch recipe, mm -hmm. right? Um, the Philadelphia Fish House, I assume, yes. being one such institution, made their own punch. This this recipe comes from General Burnside, General Ambrose Burnside, mm -hmm. who uh, was a Civil War general uh, that lost at Fredericksburg and uh, subsequently perished. Got, no, he didn't. No, he he didn't perish, but he got fired. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> he was the one uh, leading, and they were like, "You did a pretty bang up job there, General." Yeah, he 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 did not have a fantastic war, mm. um, but. Uh, you win some, you lose some. Jerry, or not Jerry Thomas. I'm sorry. David Wondrich found a recipe from his uh, from General Burnside's regiment uh, for a punch recipe that they used to make. Um, and I'm going to read the, the the intro to this quickly for you guys. Just so absolutely. You can hear so, uh, quoth Jerry Thomas in his 1863 portrait gallery. So quote because David Wondrich has some funny ways. Quoth the Wondrich. Quoth the Wondrich. This superb drink was forwarded to me by a special messenger from the general. The stolid Ambrose Burnside, whose A to B to C leadership allowed the brainless slaughter of Fredericksburg to unfold, a little bit of politically charged <laughs> there, uh, was not averse to looking on the wine when it sparkled or the whiskey when it was frisky. <laughs> a frisky so, whiskey. So he was, he, he, as in the words of the Joker, he was a drinker. He was a drinker. <laughs> um, although when it came to drinking, he was no Ulysses Grant. Unfortunately, when it came to fighting, he also was no Grant. <laughs> uh, this drink is delicious anyway once you cut the orgeau back and let the booze get in and do its work. Oh my gosh. Yeah, seriously. Now, Cam, would you care to read the, the verbatim recipe? The verbatim recipe says, in a large bar glass, this, this take me, right? half a lemon squeezed, indeed, uh, yeah. a wine glass, aka two ounces, maybe, of brandy, half a wine glass, aka one ounce, maybe, of Jamaica rum, not Jamaican, Jamaica rum, and a wine glass, y y another wine glass, but of a different size, three quarters of an ounce of orja. Fill with hot water, stir well, and grate nutmeg over the top. Source from Charles B. Campbell's American Barkeeper, 1867. That's, that is Jerry Thomas, 1863. Yeah, so a couple of interesting things to note about this recipe. Uh, first is the use of hot water. Mm -hmm. So we've not done a punch yet with hot water. Not yet, um, at least. That is actually very reminiscent of a um, more current drink that most people have heard of the the toddy, the toddy, toddy. toddy. right? Yeah. So this drink is actually gonna be pretty similar to a toddy. Interesting. If you think about that, it's like it's whiskey, mm -hmm. le lemon, lemon, some sugar, and basically then hot water. tea, but it's it's frisky, I guess. It's, it's a frisky, frisky kind of frisky, tea. Frisky whiskey tea. Oh yeah. Right? <laughs> um, so this is the first recipe we're gonna come across where it references the wine glass mm -hmm. as the size. Now, back in the day, uh, the majority of individuals did not have standardized measuring equipment. That actually didn't really come around mm -hmm. until the turn of the century. For one of my closest wine glasses around here. So exactly. Go so ahead, so so the so the amounts that were in the brackets that you read there um, are actually uh, the additions from uh, David Wondrich. Um, so a wine glass could have been any size of, of, of glass. Which um, like, which like, this, this supremely shocks me because I think of a two ounce, a two ounce container as like a little, little cordial glass here. I think is about maybe like an ounce, ounce and a half ish. But like this compared to what I understand to be a wine glass on the regular. And I have much larger wine glasses as well. And that also makes me think about like, I mean, I imagine the people of the past maybe drank more, perhaps drank less, but if a wine glass was this, then I guess it makes sense. Yeah, I was trying to find a picture, a picture here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so 
generally, uh, for most of the, for quantities, there, there's a lot of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Conversion. Conversion. Yeah, convert. Transformation. I'm, I'm an engineer. I should remember this. But. <laughs> so there's a lot you of. You don't remember your transforms class, man? It's been a long week, like I said. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of conversions for these different uh, measurements in the book. Got pints um, in so there, imperials, wine, gills. Gills and jiggers <laughs> and ponies and dashes and quartz, of course. Yeah, so so a wine glass. Um, in, by today's standards, is basically a two ounce jigger now, right? So that's like a, a, a one shot pour nowadays. So that's what a wine glass is. But if you actually look at some of the older pictures, I'm gonna put bookmark in here quickly. Mm -hmm. if you wanna hold this up to our camera here? Absolutely. Here, let me bring my our other special camera angle over here, and we can get a little view of this. So this is this is what the old uh, measurement devices there you know, used to look like. So like something like. It almost looks like, you know what this reminds me of? Is the uh, mm -hmm. Holy Grail from Indiana Jones. It does really that's, look like that. It's like a, it pretty similar looks to like a goblet like. more so than anything else. Yeah, it, that's very similar to what that cup looks like. Oh, yeah. Um, so they used to use that that glass, but the, the, whole, the whole idea was before there was a big standardization of measurements and standardization of making cocktails, mm. um, people just used whatever they had on hand. Yeah. Um, it's actually kind of similar with like cooking. People used to, like if you had a, a cup. A teaspoon, tablespoon, a cup of something yeah. as opposed like, to a standard measurement. Like a lot of places they just had their their coffee cups and that was basically the cup that they drank from and that's that they measured point. with. So that's where the cup came from. Yeah, I feel like I, I definitely read an article recently where people were talking about the various different, like when you say like a cup of coffee, the heck does, does that mean? And I was most interested in this because my, my coffee grinder says amount of cups on it. And I was like, <laughs> I'll, I'll grind it for like eight cups and it will not make more than like a single cup of yeah. coffee. And I'm like, I don't know what you're trying to tell me here. <laughs> okay, so uh, whenever it says wine glass, we're basically going to either use two ounces or we're going to see if David Wondrich has a recommendation because mm -hmm. uh, currently, if you read this recipe, it would be two ounces of brandy, like a wine glass of brandy, and two ounces of orgeau, and half a wine glass, which would be one ounce of Jamaican rum. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of alcohol oh, for one absolutely. drink. So I think we're going to cut that, and it, he does actually have a change that we're going to make. Oh, yeah. I mean, recipe. going back to the original so. description, just to cut back on the ajour a little bit, let, let the liquor do its thing. You yes. know, the orjo can only do so much. So uh, what we're going to do for this recipe, um, for the Jamaican, what, what Jamaican rum are we going to use? The Jamaican rum that I have, I honestly went to the liquor store and tried to find a Smith & Cross if I could find it. So but it's got a, you got a classic Myers rum. That'll, that'll a bit of good. a dark. Yeah, so any, any dark, like, kind of fruit-forward uh, mm -hmm. rum will work for this. Like, oh, yeah. Jamaican rum is maybe sugar cane usually. Yep, yep. So it's, it's a, especially sweet. Um, Smith & Cross I've bought. I don't know if you've had Smith & Cross no, before. No, honestly, I've had a lot of rums in my collection, and that stagnated me from going out and buying, like, the more, like, noticeable brands yeah. and stuff. I think the best, I think the most unique rum I've had in my collection was probably the Plantation 3 Star, which so is Smith, written all over. Smith & Cross rum, uh, for any of our listeners, uh, is really funky. <laughs> the, that banana funk type yeah, of rum? Yeah, it's... Uh, banana is a good way to put it, but yeah. it, but it's not a banana rum. Mm -hmm. Like there's definitely banana rum. Oh yeah, like, oh yeah, like for it. sure, for sure. It, it's more of this like island funkiness to yeah. rums. Like I think if you smell Bacardi, for example, like Bacardi is just like straight lighter fluid smell, yeah. pretty much. Um, Very alcoholic. Nothing. A good, nothing really... a good Jamaican rum or like the Smith and Cross style of rum um, is very, very pungent mm -hmm. in its like funkiness. So there, yeah, there's I a actually, lot of smells and flavors you say, going like, on there. Bringing up the idea of like a very, very funky like rum. I bought. You ever had cachaça before? Oh yeah, cachaça is oh, awesome. <laughs> and like I bought this out on a whim at the store. This is Leblanc cachaça here. And that. taking taking a bit of that and smelling hold it. That, if that. I had to rem if I had to recollect what a funky banana would smell like, oh it's yeah, this, it's this right so here. So that's very similar to what the Smith and Cross rums. This yeah. actually might be pretty good to make this with, honestly. Ooh. Here, let me taste a little bit. Yeah, go for it. Feel free to grab any of the cordials and stuff. We are we are uh, working on the fly Absolutely. During, during this. The best part of these streams when you have a fellow mixologist on is just kind of exploring things. This is the It's the creative process at work. Thoughts? Ooh, that's very interesting. It is interesting. Let's try it with this first. Yeah, if totally. If we don't like it, we'll go to the Kachas. We'll have a couple of these guys. That's really good. You say cachaca first, then the rum? No, or? no, the rum first. Rum first? Yeah, because I, 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 think, I think the darkness of it is important. Oh, for sure. All right, yeah. Cameron. So I'm going to... That's great in a Kuiperina, I will say. Yes. That is a... Excellent. That's a, that's a cocktail for another... Oh, another my time. goodness, yeah. That is a... That's not in this book. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is a newer... Well, in the, in the grand scheme of cocktails, that is a newer... Relatively one. newer. As opposed to the... What was it? We were in like the 1800s or something now? Yeah, like the most, the most recent cocktail we're going to do tonight is a Gibson Martini, mm -hmm. um, which is was made back in like the 20s, so. Stick around for the end for cocktail onions. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Cameron, uh, for our ingredients, we're gonna need a lemon. So go ahead and cut that in half. Lemon. I'm gonna reach behind you for this little cutting board here. With the big knife. 
I need a bigger knife for this guy, but all I got is the small and one. And if, uh, while we're working on this, if there are any questions from anybody in chat about this book or about what we're working on or just general uh, cocktail inquiries that you would like to make, please feel free to reach out. Cause By all means, yeah. We, I'll, we I'll also mention as well that I added a new channel point redemption where you can request a drink. And honestly, don't feel inclined that you have to spend any sort of currency, monetary value, or otherwise tokenized little Ugh. piece of fake currency to think that you have to interact or mention changes, criticisms, and otherwise. We're a rather open place here. A safe one and an open one, if you were to be so, though vocabulariously about it. But we've got our half a lemon All here. Right. So we're gonna let me see what we want to do here. Does it call for a particular amount of the lemon, or are we just they're squeezing the half? It says half a lemon squeezed. So we can get half a lemon squeezed. He does. He does comment that we should use a half an ounce. Okay. Well, lemon. that's that feels like a little less than half a lemon. These I feel like most of the lemons I get are pretty juicy. And then, are we? Gonna, do that. you have like a, a toddy mug or something that we can do this with? I do, yeah, I've got, closest thing I got, actually I only that'll have work. one toddy mug, so that'll work. Use this guy. Okay, so we're gonna do a half an ounce of lemon. Awesome. Into there. Cool. Um, We're gonna talk about a couple of the other ingredients quickly here. So for the brandy, Let's grab a brandy. All right. Uh, just just a regular brandy. We don't just want anything flavored. Nothing crazy. No yeah. cognacs or anything. Nothing nothing crazy for that. I just grabbed. I just picked up this bottle of Corbel the other day. Oh, Corbel will work. Cool. Yeah. Uh, That's good stuff. Yeah. So we're gonna do an ounce and a half of that. Perfect. And then shall we start pouring within as we cover the other ingredients and stuff? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Can you hand me one of the lemon squeezers and either either jigger you see there? Let's use this. We're gonna use this one because this looks use old. Use the Metris one. That looks a little like older and more antique. Yeah, it's this a. Is, it's, this is an antique. Stream. It's got that antiquated look to it. It's actually a metric jigger, so it measures 25 milliliters on one side and 50 milliliters on the other. Um. So we needed a half an ounce, or about. Yeah. Half, in this case, it's gonna be around like 12 and a half milliliters. Yeah, just do a half. half do a half ounce of this. Perfect. The ha I think it should be just about half that lemon. Um, I despise so this. So one, one very, while Cameron is working on this, one really interesting ingredient that we're gonna be using today, uh, which a lot of people may have not heard of, um, is orgeau. Mm -hmm. And Cam, would you like to explain how you made the orgeau? Because that is so, an ingredient you gotta make at home usually. There is a more involved process on making orgeau, or orja, as I've been corrected once upon a time. And essentially it takes any sort of milk, any sort of nut, you can create milk out of this nut, uh, not with actual lactose byproduct, but like you just kind of, you take it, you macerate it into a bunch of water and you have this kind of pulpy, pulpy, quote unquote, milky mess. You would strain that out, you'd combine it with some sort of uh, extract and liquor if possible, and a couple of other things. I think in the book Liquid Intelligence by, its name is escaping me, oh my God. Liquid Hello. Intelligence, who wrote that again? Oh, uh. Uh, uh, All these famous bartenders. Yeah, you're putting me. You're putting me. I'll, I'll tell you. Oh my mind. gosh! You're putting me on the. You're putting me on the. On the I just uh, forget the book. <laughs> David. David Arnold. David Arnold. Yeah, he's there the go. guy. He's the guy. I had. Um, I was like, oh, I'm blanking. <laughs> we used a particular combination of. I, I wouldn't call it chemical, but it has xanthan gum in there, which I was able to find at the store. And this thing called tic ticaloid, and there's a number associated with it. Yeah. I don't really know. Go ahead and, gra go and grab it real quick. We can show oh, the yeah. uh, the viewers what it we looks like. We can totally share the recipe there. So Orjo uh, is made from almonds usually. That's the. That's that's the the. The main flavor. Orgeau. It's almost like if you've, uh, yes, you can make orgeau yourself. Oh, yeah. uh, it's actually a lot better if you make it yourself. Oh, for sure. Um, it's, it is a bit of a pain because uh, if you have ever, it's basically like making um, the equivalent of like almond milk. Um, that it's very, it's very similar to almond milk in flavor. Oh yeah, for sure. Now I have another did, book that I use. The... Where did your thing of it go? Of the orgeau? Oh, it's down here in the page. Yeah, I wanted to show what it looked like. Here. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, where are you? Up on top. Top there, we there we go. Got a milky substance. Yeah. To it. How do we? How, how, control, how do I switch this one? Control numpad five. Control all the way on the right hand side, five. and that will switch to the other oh, angle, boom, which we can that. pull on over. Right. So get a better is, view of this. This is Orjo. Let me see if I can get a good shot here. Totally. There we go. So again, it's a very sort of milky uh, liquid. You can buy this. It does at, look like milk at cocktail stores. They, mm -hmm. they make a shelf stable version of this. But as with a lot of these sort of mixing ingredients, it's yeah. a lot better if you make them yourself. Uh, pom uh, sorry, not pomegranate. Um, grenadine. Grenadine is another thing that is fantastic to make yourself. Amazing. You make it with pomegranate. Yeah, as opposed um, to the cherry-like stuff they put into how it. Do I, how do I put it back here? Same, same button combo. I'll hold the control and clip five. Bam. Perfect. Teamwork. 
But uh, yeah, grenadine is another ingredient that you I would highly, highly recommend making yourself because yeah. real grenadine is made with pomegranate juice. Not the cherry uh, stuff. And cherry and high fructose and corn syrup. The hard, the hard ingredient to find for grenadine is pomegranate molasses. Oh yeah. And that is Which like very important. I can to find it at the Whole Foods down the street. Yeah, Whole Foods has it because oh, yeah. apparently like people like putting it in their coffee and stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to think that all like the very specialty ingredients that I've started to learn about over the course of the past couple of years, it's like, I, I find it like I'm on the lookout at the stores and I often spend a little bit more time in there because I'm like, I just want to look and see what all the weird <laughs> names are on the aisle. And like, I had this moment the other day where I saw a word and I was like, wait, I think I recognize this. And I looked into my little cocktail recipe book that I have mm. and I found the word again. It was called kefir. You ever heard of kefir? Oh yeah. 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 And it's I have like, this one book that like covers a, a bunch of different like kefir drinks and stuff. Yeah. It's like a yogurty uh, fermented type mm -hmm. of type of drink. Very, very yogurt. So what we're going to do, we're going to taste this because I'm, I'm a very big fan of tasting all of your ingredients as mm -hmm. you're making them because that's how you get good at being a cocktail And being able maker. to like really piece out the different ingredients yeah. and stuff. So we're going to give the Orgeo a taste here and we're going to give some tasting notes. Oh, that's really good. You did a very good job with that. Mm -hmm. this I is, will say this I took Dave a- Dave Arnold's recipe? No, I took a cheaty recipe actually. Oh, that's I'll okay. say, this I couldn't really find good. all the special stuff and whatnot, but this has got, mm. it's got a good amount of sugar in it. It's got almond milk in it. I, I awesome. think it was almond breeze or whatever. And a little, little touch of orange blossom water. And of course, some amaretto. It's actually some of the sweeter amaretto. Mm. I used like a Di Serrano last time, which is a little less on the sweet side. Yeah. But I actually really like, um, that is, I used that is really good. Lazzaroni. <laughs> That's this bottle here. Yeah, I actually, oh, yes. I, I was, is, I was meaning to taste this the other day and I completely forgot to, and I'm really getting that orange blossom so, water Kim, now. You know, you've, you've come to my house many times and I've made uh, oh, yeah. amaretto sours for the girls mm -hmm. a bunch of times. And Lazzaroni this, is this makes amazing. The, the best amaretto sour. Mm -hmm. One of these days, I, I, we got to do Jeffrey Morgenthaler's amaretto sour on stream one Ooh, day. I'd love it's, to. That's, that, you've had my amaretto sours, right? So it's, it's Jeffrey Morgenthaler's recipe. Dude, and the cocktails that this guy makes like at his house like completely like elevated my understanding <laughs> of things. Plus, he's got the vocabulary to speak around them. Cam, Cam does what he's doing as well. <laughs> Why do, I'd say, I think it's like a more wider berth. You're definitely more specialized and kind of like, I wouldn't call it a niche, but you've got a little bit deeper into the stuff. I like I like very powerful cocktails. That, mm -hmm. That's something my flavor profile, my fiance hates those. So <laughs> I have to make her very sweet cocktails. And so on my side, I'm starting to get more into like the more like, like shorter, like very alcoholic stuff that has a lot of complexity to it. Yeah. And it's just like, I can still taste the alcohol. I'm like, yeah, you probably yeah, do. Anna, Anna's in the same boat. Mm -hmm. she, she likes very sweet things. It offers you another perspective. Okay, so we have the original. That's really good honestly that's a that's a really good recipe i got that um, recipe from here what's the next ingredient i'll grab this other book that i took from. uh next well brandy is the next thing we're gonna put in perfect Let i got see. this from a book called tiki drink by weston and sherp mm. yeah this is a uh, great on the uh, if i bought this specifically i had too many runs in my collection i need to find something to do with them <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm, I actually will go ahead and measure the next one out here. Go for so it. So we're gonna do a one and a half of brandy. Let me just check his, yes, one and a mm -hmm. half of brandy. So perfect, perfect. I'd like to hold this for me, please. Put that over there. Hold that. Give that a pour for the you. The brandy, is that, have I cracked that open yet before? Or is that? See. Yeah, it's open. Okay, it looks like it. Ugh. All right. That was a part of my first online liquor order. So we're gonna, yeah, just, this, is like, a, this is a two, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna do like, three quarters of the way up because of the size of this thing. Feels That's good. It's Feels pretty good. close. If it's a little stronger, it's okay. We're, we're men. It's okay. We'll be able to handle it. <laughs> okay. So we had one and a half of brandy. Where do you got the lemon in there? Yep. The next is, is going to be three, three quarter quarters of the ounce of the rum. We'll go with the Myers this time. I want you to use your other jigger for this just so I can... Just to make sure because we got the little correct. lines in there. Yeah. This is a barfly jigger. Did you get that from barfly? I believe so. Yeah. 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 Bar, so. Barfly is a really good company. If uh, yeah, they really, they really stand up the, the <laughs> The tools. Yeah, if anybody is looking for new bar tools, I highly would recommend Barfly. Uh, I think they're. Cheap. I'm pretty sure they are. Uh, they're on Amazon, but yeah, um, they are not like just a cheapy brand. Like they actually make excellent, excellent stuff. Yeah, I think I saw Barfly recommended by a bunch of other like channels and stuff. It yeah, just, Barfly. Like, it can be a little pricey, but like it's well worth it. It doesn't fall so apart I bought, like my shaker I, does. I bought my set of Barfly stuff. Like I bought like their strainers mm -hmm. and I bought like cocktail shakers. I think I have one everything. of the strainers down there too. Yeah, I think this one. The one. Yeah, this one. This yeah. Hawthorne strainer from Barfly. This, these Hawthorne strainers, we're, sorry for a quick aside here. Oh yeah, now um, go for it. When you're buying a Hawthorne strainer, you want to buy one that has really tight uh, oh, yeah. coils here. You don't, you don't want one oh, yeah, you, like yeah. this, <laughs> which came with my original yeah. set of stuff that I picked up at like a so, liquor store. <laughs> yeah, so these, so these, these Hawthorne strainers um, are for drinks that have um, 
citrus in them because they strain out pulp. Mm -hmm. So you use these if pulp you... Pulp and the seeds. Yeah, exactly. So if you ever squeeze like a lemon into something or you're using like orange juice or anything like that, you need to strain it with a hawthorn strainer because oh, it'll yeah. get out the seeds and everything. You know, I never but, actually knew the proper use for one with the larger spring, uh, the, the spring spaces like that. Yeah. So... Well, these are kind of not very useful. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the. There's whole a very thing. specific case right. when you can use them because these these spring ones don't catch very much. So mm -hmm. these come in like all the free cocktail kits, or like you know, here's your 15 piece cocktail kit. Congrats, go wild. The uh, the Hawthorne strainers from Barfly and other high end ones. One like they feel way more solid. Like feel the feel the difference between this these is two. like this is like a flimsy piece of like sheet metal, and this thing like actually feels like you could probably hurt somebody with it. Yeah, exactly. And then the really tight coils catch everything, mm -hmm. whereas these are like just they let everything go through. So oh my gosh! <laughs> highly, highly recommend getting a, a, a high a high end Hawthorne strainer. Your drinks will be way better. Mm -hmm. I promise. We the actually other... processed a bit of cantaloupe puree the other day, and it caught most of the chunks. Although you know it was a the other, little bit more to be desired. The other cool thing I'm going to show. So you almost always use a Hawthorne strainer with a mixing glass, uh, mixing cup, right? Mm -hmm. So you sh you've shaken this already. You then take your Hawthorne strainer out. One other yeah. cool trick that you can do. You push with the fingers. You can push. So you can gate it off. So there's a spring here. Let's see if I can look, get this up. Yeah. There's a spring and you can push and actually stop even more stuff from coming through. And you'll notice too, the little ridge there, it's got a little got a little divot right there. And technically, if you have the technique for it, you can find that you can split and pour into two different glasses at the same time. Yep. Although I always manage to combine the streams together at the very end and <laughs> the technique is still in the works. Okay, that was a quick aside on Hawthorne strainers. Also, one other thing quickly. Oh, hold on. Oh yeah, oh, oh sorry, sorry, I spoke too soon. This one, do you know what this is called, Cam? Julep strainer. A julep strainer, right. Strainer. Do you know what these are for? For juleps. They are catching for, catching more finer plant particles and stuff and leaves. Yeah, so julep, julep strainers are for uh, cocktails that are only spirits. Mm. So, oh, bas okay. so basically any stirred cocktail. So you want to use like, the I did use notice this. that a lot, especially because I noticed a lot of a lot of folks will put it right into the stirring yeah. glass. It fits right, so, it fits right in there. Yeah, so you put it in. I'm sorry. Ooh, you're good. <laughs> I didn't do anything to stream die. No, everything looks good. Yeah. The so, artifacting is normal. So the... Um, yeah, sorry, I dropped that on the keyboard. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the, the julep strainers fit inside the mixing glasses like this. So mm -hmm. you use that for like Manhattans, uh, martinis, any of that kind and of I stuff. And this was only a more recent pickup that I got. More than also saying, I feel like I've seen a Hawthorne strainer where you take the spring out and make stuff like a Ramos Gin Fizz. Oh my God, that's another piece of it too. Yeah, you can actually take the spring off of here. And there we go. Yeah. And you can, I have seen cases where you can take this little string and pop it into the shaker container. Although I've never found, I feel like I've seen people on both sides saying you could do that or you're, or you're like, no, you so, don't have to. So it's, it's specifically for egg whites. Mm -hmm. you, you can put that it in does, and try to get egg a very, whites very to froth them more. Froth them I, I am more on the side of, um, you can just froth egg whites really well with good ice. Because mm -hmm. I, I I don't think the spring is unnecessary, but some bartenders like to do it. It's also kind of showy, like it's a fun, oh yeah for sure. It's very fun. There's this one there's this one guy who's always wearing like a fancy black suit and stuff. He's got a beautiful bar. Well, he'll kind of it's almost like he's I think I recall him putting the uh, the spring in, doing the shake thing, and like pulling it out with like a fine pair of tweezers so daintily, just like you just rip the shit out of that those eggs in there. Yeah, like okay. We need to finish making this cocktail. So we need, a half, we, need, we need a half ounce of the Orgeau. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna do that. And then we need hot water. Yes, indeed. I've got some probably hot water over here. Or at least it should be warm by this point. Yes, the side of the pan is still hot. That's okay. That's it doesn't need to be scalding here. Oh yeah, and then Just warm enough. How much does it say? It for says water? for in, the water. In, in his directions. In the instructions. Let's cut back the brandy there. And let's just cut it back. Um, I don't actually see any notes about the water. Fill with, fill with hot water. Here. So I think we just, oh, maybe it's not in there. Look at oh, that. Yeah, just to so fill up here. Fill with hot water and stir. Well, we're just going to kind of fill it on the way up. We'll do a little bit and see how it tastes. And if we need more, we can add more. Yeah. All right, Ooh, so I love the way it's about steaming. half. Ooh. And then we're stirred up. Yeah. We'll get a we'll get a nice angle there. If you want to grab one of the um, bar spoons, and I'll kind Stick of adjust the, the angle a little bit. Copper here. All Let me right. See so if I can. Want to see if I can get a little more leverage here. There we so go. Stir That'll that. be good. Get a nice little stirring going on there. There we go. So interestingly, there's a little bit of particulate from the Orgeau, I'm guessing. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to think what would be particulate in there. Hmm. Not really, because I, I think the recipe only used a bit of... I'm actually, it might be any of the sugar stuff kind of... Oh, no, no, no. Totally the lemon juice. Oh, yeah. Gotta be the lemon juice. 
Yep. Okay, cool. More than awesome says, I'm very interested in this orgeau. Oh, it is a It was very it was really good. We just a, tasted it's it a, a good few stuff. minutes ago if you didn't see. It, was, it has it's using a very, very good amaretto called Lazzaroni. Yeah, I think personally recommended by the both of us. I think the best way I'd describe the flavor of it is it tastes like almond milk that's sweeter and has more fruity components to it because mm -hmm. there's orange blossom water in it. I too. wouldn't even say that it's even like because it's got some amaretto in there, but I wouldn't even say it tastes like too alcoholic either. It's very it's oh, yeah. very, very mixery. How much is there alcohol in it? Yeah, it's the amaretto. But oh, that's yeah. oh right, yeah, the amaretto. Yeah. Yeah. Amaretto is only like fifteen or twenty percent. So though, very, anyways. yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty not low. high. It's at pretty low. low. Okay. Uh, all right. How much storage must we do? Yeah, I think we're good. I think we're good. Perfect. So we can taste it now. So this is General Burnside's favorite punch. Absolutely. We're tasting. You want to pour it in a couple glasses here? Yeah, we'll put this. We'll put this kettle to the side and see. Here, give me, glasses. Give me, a, give me a little bit there. You can use. Yeah, that one. sure, sure, sure. So once again, this is, I've never tried this drink. We're trying it for the first time on stream here. Boop. Go back to uh, here. Push that. Cheers, my friend. This way. General, what's his name? General Burnside. General Sides. Burnside, because the drink's hot. Burn. Mm. This is actually really good. Woo. It's really good. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. The first thing I'm getting is I taste the brandy. I taste the hot, mm. alcoholy brandy, and then the lemon. Yeah, it's excellent. So it's um that tastes very similar to a hot toddy, like yeah. honestly. Now I am gonna I'm gonna put a little bit more orgeau in mine because yeah, I, I want to see if I can get that flavor a little bit more. Yeah, I taste the orgeau just just think, a touch. I think it needs about twice as much orgeau. But yeah, I think it's almost like it kind of tastes like a hot lemon tea, and I think the orgeau will probably serve to oh, kind yeah. of kind there of there it is there almost it is. like adding milk to your so tea. Add, add about add another half Ooh. ounce. Yeah, I think I put. Yeah. Hopefully enough in there. How's my color looking toward next to yours? That looks the same. Looks yeah, it's same. way better with a little bit more orgeau. So granted, the orgeaux that he was using might have been like slightly different than this recipe, so... Mm -hmm. mm, much more palatable mm. sweetness there. Oh, the sourness really has been balanced out almost... Honestly, I'm going to add a little bit more there. It's oh, almost so balanced good. out perfectly with I, the sweetness. Yeah, I told you. Just need a little I love bit. it. Oh my gosh. Just need a little bit more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, really, and it paid really for us good. to try to chase the orgeau originally to kind of know like what it was we were getting ourselves oh, yeah. into. That's why you taste your, your ingredients because oh you, yeah. you, you need to understand how It goes how into me changing. just needing to slow down and take a sip of everything I'm putting mm. in the glass first. Yeah, so the the other interesting part is there. it definitely has like, I, I wonder if the orgeau splits in it a little bit, which is very interesting because it has a, mm. I can show you guys on stream here. Yeah, there is a really interesting phenomenon going on here. It, it almost it, looks, it's cloudy. There's a lot more particulates in there. Yeah, it almost looks like it's broken. I wonder um, if I shine a light behind it, if we'll be able to see the particulates. You can see it on better. I can even see it on there pretty good. Let me see if I see it a little better. Kind of, yeah. You can definitely see that it's cloudy. It's cloudy, but it, it almost seems like it's split a little bit, but mm -hmm. it's it still tastes very good. It's not like it's, it doesn't have a texture. No, nothing nothing other than like, yeah. I guess I can feel I can feel the pulp a little bit, but for the most part, it's very, I, I'd say it's more smooth than anything yeah. else. This is just kind of shiny. This is, this is awesome. This is a really, really good cocktail. And it smells good too. I think I'm really smelling the orange blossom water and the orange oh, it's, it's fine. It's very fine. Yes, more than awesome. I, I agree. It definitely split in an interesting way. And it's, oh it, it's interesting because like if you guys have ever had like a... Egg drop uh, soup is what I'm looking at right yeah, here. Yeah, egg, drop, it... egg drop soup or like, <laughs> uh, like an Irish car bomb. Oh my uh, god, yeah. It's almost, it almost looks like in. it's curdled, but there's nothing There's nothing. There's no, milk in here. There's no... Cur so I, I could see the acidity of the lemon juice mm -hmm. causing some of the... Um, the almond milk to yeah. to uh, curdle. Yeah, I guess I wonder what would be in the almond milk. Well, there's protein. There's it. protein in almond milk. That's a so good point. It was supposed to curdle the other proteins and stuff. But what I was saying is like it doesn't taste. So like when something mm -hmm. curdles, I'm gonna switch back to the stream. Oh, he said. Uh, they said. I uh, yeah. Go ahead and switch back. <laughs> uh, so more than awesome said. I drink a lot of Trinidad sours, and those are also a very textured. Oh my cocktail. goodness! Yeah, with all that's the Angostura a, in there. Yeah, and that's that's a fascinating <laughs> drink because mm -hmm. it's it's got like what two ounces of Angostura bitters. Anywhere in it? between, I think, an ounce to a full two ounces. Yeah, an Angostura. That is a powerful drink. Oh my gosh! Um, yeah. I'm working my way up to it. I had a couple of weeks ago. I made like a it, it's a it's basically like a mezcal mm -hmm. like Man, Trinidad good. sour uh, with I think about a half an ounce in there, and it was it was very very good. The other thing I would be curious about is if you change the order that you put these ingredients in. Mm -hmm. So if you 
if you add the orzo last, that mm -hmm. may stop it from splitting. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Because the, it, we did add it straight to the lemon juice, so the yeah, so there was extreme acidity may have splitted. A bit of a very powerful gradient there, a yeah, difference between It still two. doesn't it doesn't taste bad at all. Like, no, it, Honestly, it doesn't even have like all that much of a texture, I, no. I think. And it's interesting in particular, I'm not I'm not big on the sour stuff, but the, the orzo, mm. like, you are able to add it in such a way that it really, really, really balances the whole thing out. That was a great cocktail. Really, really good. Oh my goodness, yeah. So that was the General Ambrose Burnside from the United States Civil War. United States, a very right. failed his, general. His for punch. Indeed. Uh, more than awesome, said, I've got buttons for Trinidad's on the registers at a few restaurants near me because I keep ordering it, and they used to charge <laughs> me for well rye. Oh my goodness! That's a that's that's, that's a good deal. <laughs> that's a that's that, a because that's an expensive drink. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it's a testament to your dedication to the Trinidad you, Sour. You can tell people make Trinidad sours when they have a very large, large bottle, bottle of, of Angostura. Yeah, like, why would you ever need that amount? You definitely weren't buying that for the value. Okay, Cam. I think we're ready. Do you have any more thoughts on on the punch? I think we uh, we've done a lot of punch the last couple of the months. The thing that I think I like the <laughs> most about this particular punch is it's like it's like somehow lemon juice has been combined in such a way where it goes down smooth. And I don't mean smooth like because I got my acid thing going on. It's not like smooth back there as in like a lack of a burn or anything. It's just like on the tongue, the mouth feel is like it's creamy. And like I love that about it. And it's definitely the orange. Yeah. And I think Which that I was a, make very often. that was a good lesson too in like being able to adapt your cocktail after you make it. Because mm -hmm. like when we first tried that, that was it was too acidic. Mm -hmm. um, it was a pretty, then, pretty boozy too. Well, and it's still kind of is. Booze, boozy's okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I'm feeling it right now. <laughs> but it's warm. Boozy, it's warm in yeah. all different ways. Boozy is okay, but um, mm -hmm. acidic, you need to make sure it's balanced with sweetness. So you yeah. can either add syrup, um, or you can add like something like orgeau that has sweetness in it. Mm -hmm. But don't don't be afraid to add. A little bit more of an ingredient to a cocktail after you've made it. Yeah, especially if you know like kind of what your preferences are. If you know you're not much of a sour person, add a bit of simple syrup in there. It'll make the experience more pleasant for everybody. For you, because it'll taste better, and for the other folks, because they won't have to look at your face going like, hmm, you know. So, Cam, okay, how's David Wonders doing so far? Well, so far it's uh, one out of one. That he's, was, he's winning. That's, that's he's winning. Fantastic. That's right. Well, I believe we we need to change the name of the cocktail because we're moving on to, to something completely different we say completely different or it's uh it's it's in the chronology of cocktail Absolutely. history here so let's see you want to pop that in. the next one we've got is what we call it an Im drum roll what we call it an improved cocktail what we call it just the cocktail plus or what would be the best so, way of referring to this particular cocktail? so we're gonna be making jerry thomas's improved cocktail okay now this is a recipe from i believe 1874 1876, I was We're making right further yes. up the timeline. Further up the timeline. So, uh, a brief aside, we're not gonna go over the, the whole history of quote unquote the cocktail on the cocktail. stream because Jerry Thomas, I'm sorry, David Wondrich mm -hmm. wrote uh, like an entire, probably 25 page chapter on where the word cocktail came from. Uh, briefly, I'll, I'll give my one interesting thing that I've, I read in the book that I enjoyed. Um, the, the cocktail, first appeared in the lexicon of um the united states in 1803 uh from a uh newspaper from new hampshire that talked about uh their husband drinking uh many uh glasses of quote unquote cocktail before they cocktail. went to bed uh to knock them out so kind of kind of funny aside but the basically the story to summarize of where the cocktail came from is like i had said there was a lot of spirits in the united states uh that did not fit the bill for these more classic drinks and the people were also kind of getting sick of those more classic drinks um so do you have a particular spirit as an example in this case? Yeah, gin, like gin's a good example mm -hmm. of that, right? Because we're kind of talking a little bit about that earlier. Yeah. So you don't have like any of these stronger like whiskeys or gins in punch recipes or in these more like uh, community focused recipes. They just, now, weren't, they just weren't around. Now they did have uh, recipes like the whiskey smash and the whiskey flip. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Which, so the smash is like you you basically are putting a ton of fruit into it and then and then mixing it, it yeah with a muddler <laughs> um, and then flip cocktails are with eggs. Mm -hmm. um, and those are actually kind of getting popular again, but the flip um, ones, yeah, the or, the, or the egg ones. Flip. Well, that, that, that's what it is. A flip is an egg. Two one. in the same. Um, so those have been kind of getting popular. 
more than awesome saying he's got the big ango bottle and taking the stopper from and hoping this didn't prove that it was a sazerac and old fashioned ha and a so old fashioned had a baby <laughs> well so it's just depending on the ingredients inside yeah we actually going to be talking about the improved cocktail and also the sazerac kind of this was right? this was your oh, yeah. cordial right we'll my, save that for other that's tastings. my orgio okay. that's my orgio glass good stuff so um Yes, so there, the basically back in the day, there was a desire to want to drink these stronger spirits in uh, more individualized drinks, mm -hmm. as um, opposed to them being more in the large or like large portion where you have to share them with everybody. What yeah. if you just wanted one for your own? And then the other piece to it was uh, if you imbibed in those types of hard alcohols, you were generally viewed as like a drunk because mm -hmm. people couldn't. Can consume. you drink whiskey straight? What is right. wrong? You know, yeah, interesting nowadays you can't come, yeah that's kind of come for full circle now right like, people love drinking whiskey neat like oh i love god had, yeah at dude our, our ever, stream. ever since the thankma stream i like i i will now take like not only just the whiskeys <laughs> but the brandies too and i'll be like breathe out in sip yeah. it's a game changer it really <laughs> uh, that that whole segment that we did like mm -hmm. blew your mind so much i was still, <laughs> I'm still amazed by it even today yeah that was fun it's yeah, important should, to take those lessons and like run with them so that you can in, you can blow the mind of somebody else. We can do that on another stream sometimes. That was that, that was a lot of fun. Dude, an entire just whiskey tasting stream? Oh, that'd be fun. I need a budget for that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I got a few bottles at home. Yeah. I think if we pool our resources. I've been what some. I've been doing is I've been trying to buy a little bit more every month and trying to broaden my horizons. So instead of having a single bottle of Rittenhouse rye, I've got three bottles of what you could consider to be grain alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what a quote unquote cocktail, cocktail. is. Cocktail. So nowadays, the definition of a cocktail is like very, very different. Like there's a million different things it can be. But mm -hmm. back in the day, a cocktail was literally just a spirit. So it could be whiskey, it could be gin, it could be, I guess, vodka. The vodka was not common back then because mm -hmm. they just. Uh, the closest thing to vodka was grain alcohol, yeah. right? Like they yeah. like bathtub, bathtub gin, type hooch of stuff. and stuff. Yeah, moonshine. Mm -hmm. Um. But uh, a cocktail was just the spirit, sugar, and then some bitters. More like a, form, a okay. formula for the most part. Yeah, and that, that is what the plain cocktail that Jerry Thomas started mm -hmm. with back in the day. Spirit, sugar, Spirit, bitter. sugar, and bitters. That's right. So you take your spirit, mm -hmm. you, or I'm sorry, you take your bitters, you would moisten a sugar cube, and then you'd stir the, cop, the, the spirit into mm -hmm. the sugar. That sounds a lot like an old fashioned. Oh yeah. Right? Which is an evolution of the cocktail, or diversion it, from it? it? It's an evolution of it, there right? So the, the OG cocktail, again, this is not a specific spirit. This is just literally any spirit. You put sugar into it, mm -hmm. and then bitters. And that's and, all. And the it's, that's, the, that's the beauty of it. And the idea is you're trying to make something that's more palatable, mm -hmm. so you don't, one, over drink. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's something you can enjoy, yeah. but it's also something that tastes good. Totally, right? too. Yeah. So, so that is that is what the original quote unquote, the plain cocktail came from. There's three cocktails to lead up to the improved cocktail, okay? So mm -hmm. that's number one. Number two is what they call the fancy cocktail, okay? Fancy. Now, in the old day, and this is all from David Wondrich's book, so again, if you guys want more information on this, I'm, I'm gonna give a brief summary because we have a lot to get yeah. to tonight. There, I don't think there's a single like serious cocktail mixologist out there who is on the airwaves that doesn't at least mention in passing, imbibe, but in bold text as opposed to otherwise. Like, yeah. you, you can't ignore this book. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing book. If you guys like if you guys like um, anything related to cocktails, this is just like a fascinating book. It won a James Beard Award, and like not that many cocktail books win James Beard James Beard What's Awards. It's a James Beard Award. That's like the cookbook of the year. Oh like, damn! James, okay. The James Beard Awards are for like the best restaurants and the best cookbooks. Oh, okay. So it's, it's a big for Eric, Eric here is not just a mixologist, but also like a very prolific cook as well in the, in the in the home. Cam so has gotten to eat a lot of my food. God, we went over at his place for friends friends Friendsgiving for Thanksgiving. It was. Probably some of the, I'm, I'm not even kidding, but some of the best food I've ever eaten. I'm still, I still feel those green beans with the pomegranate Ooh, yeah, in my mouth, good. with the, the mustard seed. Yeah, those turned out amazing. Those turned out really good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have the plain cocktail. Now, the fancy cocktail is exactly the same as the plain cocktail. So it's spirit, bitters, and sugar. But they started adding uh, a, another strong, uh, like, aperitif mm -hmm. to it, basically. So uh, the original one that they added for the fancy cocktail was dry yeah. curacao. Oh, okay. yeah, so yeah. Not not, not Mar Mar Skinner, yes, that's, that's where we're going to get to with the mm -hmm. improved cocktail. So dry curacao. Now, what is dry curacao? Dry, do you do you know what dry curacao is? To my knowledge, you take the orange, the bitter the, the bitter curacao oranges, and you yep. distill it. I guess. Yeah, that's what I imagine. Yeah, it, it's it's a distillate made mm -hmm. from uh, Seville oranges. Which ah, is okay. The, that's the type of the orange that's on the island of Curacao. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
I'm trying to remember. I actually don't remember off the top of my head how they got there. Um, they're not native to it. It's like yeah, a, I don't think so. I think they're more. Like I guess more north there. Well, I think in, it, in Europe. Yeah, I think it was some European, you know, group brought them. Yeah, there. I don't remember where. It might have been Italy. Has like the really bitter orange stuff. I guess Campari, Italy, makes sense. Yeah, orange. I mean, it, I also that's not Seville. Seville orange sounds uh, Spanish to me, but I'm, yeah. I don't know that hundred <laughs> percent. If anybody in chat knows, that would actually be nice to know. I, like the or the oh, the origins of yeah. the orange. But like like I was saying earlier, um, dry curacao is really similar to like Grand Marnier, which most everybody has had. Um, it's Except also like, me. it's also in the I same, you had triple sec? I have it. Yeah. Do you but have, it's, do you it's have the, any Grand Marnier here? I don't have Grand Marnier. I have triple sec. However, it's, it's like your, your decoy yeah, stuff. And like, this is, this is not the right reference. Yeah. That's powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it has, a, it has the right smell actually. Does it actually? Um, yeah. In terms of the smell. So that, that taste, that will taste similar, but it doesn't have the drying effect. Mm, I feel that. What's going on, Rice Aroni? Info Seville oranges are trying transplanted on Curacao from Spain in 1527. Did not thrive in there in the arid climate and soil of the southern Korean island. Ooh, so it was Spanish. Yeah, it was Spanish. Was that's right. way far back too. So does that oh, mean that those oranges did not survive though? That's that's interesting because mm -hmm. I know I I know on the island they have a special orange tree that they make the Curacao from. I wonder if it's like some like off genus from it that's kind Maybe. of acclimated could, to the area. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, that's interesting. Anyways, yeah. thank, thank you for looking that up. I Thanks, Rice Surrounding. At least I was right that it was Spain. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, if we guess enough, we'll eventually triangulate around the proper point. So, anyways, dry dry Curacao. Mm. Um, it, it it tastes very similar to Grand Marnier, but it's not as sweet, and it has a drying effect similar to like a really dry, dry white wine. Curacao. Yeah. So if you think of like a really dry red or white wine, mm -hmm. like that effect you get on yeah. your palate. Interesting. That, I think it's all the tannins and stuff in there. I suppose. Do they? Do we? Do we know if we take them from like the peels of the orange? Because I can imagine, mm. or maybe even the pith on the inside. I. That's kind of dry. I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, I honestly. I know. I know persimmons are a very, very tannin, very dry fruit in the right condition. So I wonder if the Seville oranges are similar in that regard. And they're trying oh, it says more. they did survive, but they had become, a, but they had to become acclimated to the air. Mm, Makes sense. There we go. Okay. There we go. So I wasn't wrong. Evolution, <laughs> baby. Yep. Okay. Cool. So that was the uh, fancy, fancy cocktail. cocktail. So that was kind of the next version that the bartenders started to do. Evolving from just mm. spirit plus sugar cube or sugar otherwise plus bitter, we are now sugar plus bitter cube plus spirit plus something else some other addition yep. in this case a dry curacao and so that brings us to the improved brandy gin or whiskey cocktails so that's the three spirits that we're kind of looking mm. for this now i'm gonna read you just the first paragraph to this there's a very long commentary about this cocktail but oh, i think yeah. i think this first paragraph summarizes this cocktail very well among the drinks in that ground in the groundbreaking 1876 appendix to jerry thomas's book which is Jerry Thomas was the original bartender that started writing down a lot of recipes mm -hmm. and kind of like made bartending a, uh, Almost, a profession. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was he was kind of like the guy that wrote it all down and like mm -hmm. he, he's reminds, the father of bartending. It reminds me a lot of just the way that music like wasn't written down for a long, long time until like, I guess like, I'm very bad with my music history, but it's when they made the staff and stuff like that. Yeah. Now we finally have a means to be able to like kind of share the knowledge with each other in terms of measurements and exact quantities. So uh, in that appendix, uh, there were improved versions of the three standard cocktails, which is brandy, gin, and whiskey, um, all sharing the same basic formula. Uh, in brief, so this is important, mm. curacao is out. So we're getting rid of the dry curacao. Get that stuff out of here. And Bring on replacing the it is maraschino. I'm gonna grab all the base okay. spirits that we have here. Uh, and then the option of Angostura was given. So now it doesn't have to just be, I think Peychaud's bitters was one of the more original mm -hmm. style of I bitters. That as well. But you also could just have like any brand of bitters that you had. Angostura came onto the scene right around that time. And so they started introducing Angostura into these cocktails. Put the triple sec here as um, a stand-in for dry curacao. So. They also talked about adding absinthe. So that's, mm. the, that's the other big thing we're gonna talk about. Um, oh, cool. So absinthe is also in this cocktail. So the ingredients, I'm going to actually let Cameron read this part because Cameron's reading all of the verbatim recipes tonight. The verbatim <laughs> recipe from the guide here says using an ordinary bar glass, I don't know what the measurements on that are, two dashes of Boker's or Angostura bitters, three dashes or about a teaspoon of gum syrup, two dashes or half a teaspoon of maraschino, one dash or about an eighth of a teaspoon of absinthe, one small piece of of the yellow rind of a lemon twisted to express the oil and one small wine glass or about two ounces of in square brackets spirits which could be in this case your whiskey 
your cognac, your gin, or I guess technically whatever else you wanted. Yeah, I mean, this this formula kind of applies to everything. Mm -hmm. And then finish, finish off reading that there. Fill glass one-third full of shaved ice, shake well, and strain into a fancy cocktail glass. The flavor is improved by moistening the edge of the cocktail glass with a piece of lemon. And that actually is a trick that you guys can still use to this oh, day. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, it's an excellent way to rim a glass, too. It's, just, it's got a nice stickiness to it that'll yeah, keep it. You, you don't have to do it. I wouldn't actually recommend doing it with a piece of lemon mm -hmm. um, unless you're going to be rimming the glass. Right. Um, because that that's like the whole point of actually using the juice. Um, if you want to just get the flavor, uh, express the peel and then rub the oh, yeah. rim of the glass with the peel because the oils will get on there. But yes, you won't yeah. dilute the drink with extra citrus. Yeah. That's like and one of the rimming. Oh my gosh. Like, I think I didn't really believe in the whole like expressing the oils over the top of the drink to more or less transform it. But I've been doing that a lot recently. And it's so interesting to be able to now pick out the difference between like, I just spritzed some lime ju uh, lime oil on it or lemon oil or orange oil and being like wow this really kind of changed like the entry into the cocktail itself and plus there's a little bit on the rim so it kind of affects the, the flavor of the drink as well exactly that's good so uh more or less what we're gonna be doing in this cocktail is we're gonna be using gin for this one mm -hmm. um perfect actually we could use cognac we used cognac in the last one though so let's let's use gin for this one gin because the next cocktail we have has rye yeah and i don't want to just be drinking rye all night um, so for a bad time. So we're gonna use Angostura bitters for this one, uh, which we need our bottle of. We got Angostura. Let me go down here, and I'll grab the Kashaws as well, just in preparation. There's yep. Joe. So there. we're gonna be using now. Gum syrup is something you can still get nowadays. You can make that, but we're just gonna use simple tonight because it's it's just a sweetener. Gum, yeah. gum syrup has a little bit more texture to it. That's yeah, the, I did try to syrup. find to see if I could find any syrup de gum or gum arabic or anything at the stores, and I honestly couldn't find that. I eventually want to try because it, it showed up in quite a couple of the recipes that we we're looking at this evening. Yeah. And I was like, I gotta have this in my collection. All right, so I'm gonna read this one off to you, Cam. Perfect. And you can mix while we are, while I'm reading this off to you. Will you hand me a jigger, please? Yes, Anyone will do. Oh, do I have them over here? Just kidding. All, I think you have all of them. I have all of them. There's only two, and I have both of them. <laughs> all right, let's pull up the cocktail cam here. All right. So, let's see if I can. We're going to start off. So, generally, when you're making a cocktail, like this is a good rule of thumb to follow when you're making cocktails at home. You want to start with the cheapest ingredients mm -hmm. because uh, you don't want to put your expensive ingredient in. Because if and you then screw up early, and then you right. just got to toss the whole lot of so, money out the door. That means the last ingredient we're going to be putting in here is probably the maraschino because... Tall, expensive bottle. Maraschino is an expensive bottle. Yes, I would highly recommend actually, buying a big one. Yeah, I probably should. I think actually in this case, the gin that we're using might be the more expensive one here, but I think traditionally, yeah, so, depending on what you're using. So this gin we're using is the Botanist, botanist which I is te dry. It's technically a dry gin. Mm -hmm. This is not as dry as London. Uh, we tasted like this London before dry? the stream. It's not as dry is beef eater mm -hmm. um which is kind of that's the london dry that i compare everything else to because i think beef eater yeah. is a fantastic beef eater is like some of my first gin. gin that i tried and i was like this yeah. is very pleasant it's a really really good gin for mixing mm -hmm. it's a very neutral palette um, yeah but it's still very dry and it's still got good juniper flavor to it yeah absolutely um, holland gin or plymouth gin is a, a more common commonly known one um Bot is more expensive here than the Lux. It's true. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think, I don't remember what I paid for this one. It's been a while. I use it very sparingly, but I think this was a gift from a friend. Yeah, so Plymouth Gin, Plymouth Gin is the, or, or Holland Gin, Old Tom Gin, all of these are kind of in the same family. It's mm -hmm. like, aside from London Dry Gins, there's a lot of different flavor profiles of gin that you can get. I have one other um, gin back here, and it is a Keystone State favorite easy drinking. I don't know what type of gin it is. I mean, smell it. Doesn't really, but, can't really tell. But yeah, so if you can find, like, Plymouth is my favorite version of, like, quote unquote Holland gin. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually a gin that didn't really exist until uh, David Wonders put, put this book out. Now, the Holland is not the same as the dry, yeah, so this is, dry gin. This, in this is case. closer. This is closer to um, mm, the more Holland beef, gin? To Beef Eater. I see. I see. But yeah, I picked it up. Yeah. Anyways, so we're just going to use this one. You can do this with any gin. Exactly. If you want to be really uh, old timey official, old timey and go, go for Plymouth brand because Plymouth mm -hmm. brand gin does taste really different. I honestly don't remember what they do to make it different, but it's <laughs> it's less it's less um, it's less dry on the on the back of the, mm -hmm. back of the palate. Basically. The details of how they get it that way and how they produce and whatnot are far beyond the scope of this particular stream. Yeah, and we don't care. <laughs> so <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start with um, some bitters. 
because that's a nice that's a nice cheap thing to to, to add in there. So do we, we need to add any glass any any ice to this glass. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it after. So oh, perfect. Yeah, perfect. So, we're, so I don't a couple of these ice suggestions I don't agree with mm -hmm. um, in the book mainly because we're gonna be talking while we're making this. Yeah. So it'll take a little bit while and it'll dilute. And it will dilute. Yeah. I I always recommend adding ice after you get the, the drink mixed because you want to control the dilution mm -hmm. uh, as as much as you can and the by little adding it earlier it doesn't that doesn't help you. The smaller time I guess the less time that you have while the ice is in there before you're in control is allows you to be able to control that dilution. Yeah, and refer to uh, David Arnold's, Dave Arnold's book on ice and dilution. dilution. Uh, oh, that is yeah. a fascinating scientific uh, excapade. I've been like, I've been, into, anytime into I do my shaking stuff now, I'll take the ice before it's had a chance to come to room temperature, put it in the glass, and I'll watch it as it kind of like comes to room temperature and pour off the excess water with it. Yeah. And it's a cool trick. I, I honestly thought there'd be a lot more water out of it, but for the most part, I guess it kind of varies, to be honest. Yeah, I think the, the one... Uh, Side note with that technique is mm. you, you have to have it completely submerged. Yeah. Because if you have it in the air, it, there there will be ice that melts on the top too. At a yeah, speed. that's true. Yeah. And then that additional water will come off. But mm. that's that's a different story. Science. Okay, so let's do two dashes of Angostura in the bottom there. I usually like to start with bitters whenever I'm making these types of cocktails. One, two. Okay. And then we're gonna do a teaspoon of gum syrup. Now a teaspoon is about a quarter ounce. Perfect. Uh, that's that's usually usually whenever something has a teaspoon. Let me grab my syrup from the fridge. Yeah, grab the syrup you made earlier. This is a two to one syrup. Um, I almost always recommend making two to one simple. And it's in a Campari bottle. Why is it yellow? I think I had the temperature a little too high. I was a little not so oh. patient with it. Okay. Yeah. Well, it'll taste good. Oh see. yeah. Oh, it's got some roasty toasty going on there. That's okay. Yeah, I it'll, watched it. I was I actually as I was <laughs> making this last night, I was like, wait a minute, it's turning color. I was like, wait. It's caramelizing. It's yeah. not supposed to be doing well, that. It's going to add flavor. That's it a, will. That's not a bad thing. A little more. So for everybody, character. for everybody on the stream, um, there's two types of syrups you can make. You can make one to one by weight syrup. That's very important by weight, not by volume. Mm. Um, so you can do one to one, um, or you can do two to one by weight. Um, I prefer to do two to one because you can leave two to one syrup out of the fridge. Yeah. You don't have to leave two to one syrup. You don't have to put two to one syrup in the fridge because it's uh, got such a high concentration of sugar that Just microbes either. can't live actually. Yeah. I'm particular about my syrups and I made a shockingly large amount of it. So I'm keeping mine in the fridge just as a precaution. Yeah. It will last a little longer that way, mm. but do not leave out one to one syrup. If no. you leave one to one syrup it's out, it'll, it'll, really mold in, it'll mold in like a week. Uh, yep. So that, that's got to stay in the that mistake fridge. before. If, if you want to be safe, just keep it in the fridge also helps with diluting your cocktails because it doesn't uh warm the ice up mm -hmm. right that's so point. that's another yeah. thing to think of okay uh next what we're gonna do is we need the maraschino left next or the gin in this case let's just go in for the gin next going for it i want to finish with the other two at the end yeah All right, so we're gonna do uh two ounces of that two full ounces so let's give that a pro put us back on the Ooh. cocktail cam here pour it in there right now we've got a nice like uh honestly the angus store has given that the most color out of everything so far. I think it kind of blends it. It almost looks like the bar light is refracting around it. We'll add our gin in there. Change up the color just a tad. Two full ounces are about 59 to 60 milliliters. Just about. Yeah, whatever that conversion is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so next, we're going to go with these the other two ingredients. So this is basically right now the plain cocktail right that was like the og plain cocktail that we've, we've got just our made sugar right in now. there we've got our bitters right. in there and we've got our spirit in there control. that's this og control right or shift a control control, control and this there you go you got yeah. it so um so right now this is basically the plain cocktail so it's sugar bitters and the spirit mm -hmm. now we're going to make it the improved version improved. so by adding something a little special yeah so we're not doing fancy because we're not using curacao mm -hmm. but we're going to use two additional spirits we're going to use maraschino first so this is a quarter teaspoon of maraschino so i would just do like two dashes of that like all right same and let me see do the I'll best grab a, you can grab a bar spoon yes yeah we'll grab one of the other ones yeah, over there one, i tend to like one, a bar spoon one bar <laughs> one bar spoon Woo! that's probably okay sorry microphone Oh, sorry if that was loud, guys. <laughs> yeah, bar spoon. I like the flavor of maraschino, so I don't mind Ooh, doing. As do I? Yeah, that's honestly going to find more uses for maraschino. Yeah, I think the, the, the maraschino makes an appearance in a last word cocktail, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah, it's in a last word. Um, it's Still haven't a, made one of those. I need to. Um, my, my favorite cocktail that has maraschino is an aviation. Oh, that's a good. Yeah, which is yeah. Aviations are fantastic. Delightful. You, you have to get a good creme de violet though. That's very important. Which I do not have. I, I have that at home too. 
if you ever want to make. I've been meaning to grab some from the. I keep. I, I they have it. They have it at Reading. They have it at Reading Terminal. Oh, like the good stuff. Yeah. Ooh, well, it's, yeah. It's like a local one, but it's it's really good. I like down that. At, down at Reading ter at Reading Terminal. Coolio. Um. Okay, so we've got the maraschino in there. Real quick, Cam, do you want to tell them what maraschino kind of tastes like? Maraschino to me is kind of like, if you were to imagine like to all the different parts of a cherry. You got your skin on the outside, you got your stem, you got your seed on the inside. I would say that maraschino to me almost tastes like the smell, like biting into a cherry peel, but the, the distinction there is the pit on the inside that makes so, sense at all. As it's always, very, if it's very similar to um, uh, Kirschwasser. Which is just a, a cherry oh, yes. ODV, which I have a that's little a, bit of. That's a really good oh my God, uh, it's great. comparison, actually. That's so good. Now, nice, nice sweetness to it. It's it's almost like it's almost got like an almost um, not menthol, not what I'm looking for, but there's almost like an airiness to it that's very similar to like an like an amaretto almond. However, it's not almond in this case, not like any sort of like that. It's the cherry instead. Yeah, it's it's like the um, it's like the the bitter part of a cherry mm -hmm. that you taste. <clears throat> yeah. but it's also sweet. more more sweet definitely more yeah. sweet than a kirschwasser yeah there's there's sugar in in yeah. maraschino um it does not taste like a maraschino cherry though no um it has it has similar flavor profile yeah but it is not as fruity and it's not as sweet it's more of the bitter tones of mm -hmm. cherry which yeah there is, is like awesome a, for cocktails the bitterness that kind of stays on my tongue it's it's almost it's it's pointy in a way if i had to describe it Man, shit's good Mm -hmm. it's, I, very, uh, it's very i'm starting to notice a lot of like the the um kind of sugary spirits that go into yeah. the classic cocktails are just really nice sippers too so here's a here's a, a good trick for you too if you ever have a cocktail with maraschino in it and your cocktail is too acidic maraschino is one of the things you can add to balance it better hmm. it's sweeter yeah it is right, so most ingredients you can put into either a acidic and a non-acidic category. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take, and water is an uh, exception to this, but um, usually if you add more of a spirit or you add more citrus, it gets more like more citrusy, more bitter. Yeah. Um, in, in very rare circumstances where that doesn't happen. Like sometimes you have a spirit with sugar in it and then that's that changes true, things. True. Or you can add more simple syrup or you can add these Maraschino. Uh, these sort of uh, fortified spirits that have yeah. sugar in them. And that's actually a really good point to bring up too because I feel like oftentimes what I run into is, again, not, not a huge sour kind of guy. So I'll find these drinks that are really, really sour and like to know that, I think feel like the default is just, oh, I can just add some sweetness to it, a little bit of simple syrup. But of course there's a bunch of different types of syrups that you can use, but there's also these uh, this entire family of liqueurs as well that add a completely different angle to it too while also bringing up the sweetness and counteracting the various different types of sours that you're putting in right exactly so it's all about balancing right mm -hmm. you want cocktails to be balanced so you don't want them to be overly uh acidic or overly bitter and you don't want them to be overly sweet yeah because we've all had overly sweet cocktails that's like the majority you get in like college bars are like mm -hmm. too sweet and it re leads to a really really bad hangover yes that is true too <laughs> if you wanted that much sweetness you probably should have gone to the ice cream cheap alcohol bar. plus a lot of sweet is bad mm -hmm. okay uh the last thing we're gonna put in is absinthe Ooh, okay. that should be right on your right hand side of the top shelf that big old rectangle oh yeah oh i actually have this bottle too this, oh yeah this is good stuff it is the only one that i can find and <laughs> it, is, have, it is good do you have really a, an empty dash Dasher bottle? I don't have a Dasher bottle, unfortunately. Do you the closest have... thing I have is a pipette. Oh, that'll actually work, because we need like a very small amount of this. Oh, like indeed. He says a quarter or an eighth of a teaspoon. I wonder, which I is wonder like, if I can just like... You probably could. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to like dip the... Come on, come on, uh, come on. I mentioned on. fortified spirits. Remind me what that is. So a fortified spirit uh, there is we go. generally a spirit that has sugar added to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, oftentimes I think you would consider like a vermouth as like a fortified wine, not a spirit in this case, but you can fortify it and provide like, like yeah, almost more more sugar to give more fuel for well, the. Yeah, and stuff it, to do its it job. also it doesn't have to just be sugar. So vermouth is a good example. So like, uh, vermouth is fortified with mm -hmm. uh, like additional uh, botanicals, flavor, and botanicals stuff. and flavorings and stuff. Port wine is actually technically a fortified wine too mm -hmm. because it has sugar added. To Port it. sherry and Manura. Yeah, all of those dessert wines. Oh yeah, um, are technically fortified wines. Yeah, um, because of the addition of the sugars. Yeah, stuff. but it's it's, it's basically <clears throat> to answer your question, uh, I might go. I might. Ima chow. I, I'm a chow. Ima chow. Ima chow. Sorry, Ima chow. Uh, to answer your question, it, it's a it's a uh, spirit that has some sort of an additional ingredient added to it after the the distilling is done. Mm -hmm. Um. So you could even like even technically like that uh, apple like apple pie moonshine that you oh, can yeah. buy, yep, you know, yep. that, where they they distill it, and, it. Yeah, they distill it and then they mix it with. So that so apple that, pie so, so that by yeah. itself is not fortified, mm -hmm. but a lot of times they'll add oh, a, uh, additional 
stuff to it. Yeah. To and I think the, the original, I guess the idea behind the fortification, I think from what I've read is like when you would fortify the wines and stuff, it's to make sure that they can last the journey across the ocean if they were trying yeah. to make the trip there. But I suppose like if you're fortifying things otherwise, I don't know if there's more reason there aside from just it tastes good or it gives a different characteristic to it. Or to be able to have something that's like high high booze, but uh, also got a noticeable sweetness to it. Yeah. Well. I think port, port wine is like one of the best examples of, oh, yeah. of a fortified like I'll drink mm -hmm. so it's a fortified wine yeah um this is a spirit that has sugar added to it because th this does not have this amount of sugar in it after it's done distilling yeah so they, and have, I wonder, they have to add sugar to it i guess i wonder if maraschino is even considered like a liqueur technically it, speaking. it is a it is a liqueur mm -hmm. or a liqueur, liqueur. liqueur. Yeah, with liqueur. suppose I, I don't know if this is a rule but suppose with the liqueurs have equal to or greater percentage of sugar than it is the alcohol. It does It does say on the back, delicious on fruit salads, strawberries, raspberries, kiwi, and pineapple. And to be fair, I've definitely had cookies that taste like they've definitely yeah. got a little bit of that, that in there. Sounds, all of that sounds good. <sighs> okay, Amazing. so put two drops into there. So let's do a drop and another yep. drop. So absinthe, uh, for bit. those of you that don't know, we're actually be using this in our next cocktail as well, the Sazerac. Mm -hmm. um, absinthe is a uh, alcohol made from wormwood. Yeah, uh, and it wormwood, has wormwood, gentian, a lot of a lot of other botanicals as well. But I think historically, it's supposed to be the wormwood in there. Yeah, and it's it's very powerful. Um, traditionally, so that there's kind of two ways that you can have absinthe. You can mix it into the drink in very small amounts. There's some drinks that use a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. um, but the the most common way to use absinthe actually is to rinse a glass with it because it has a very very uh, it's noticeable, distinct, very so. noticeable flavor to you it. You know what? Well. We've been doing this all night. Let's have a, a little bit. Little taste this. A little bit of it. Glass. Yeah, go for it. But it's, it's pour a little very, bit in my glass. It's a very strong taste. Yeah, I found too that absinthe for me is very licorice-y. It's very fennel -y. It's got those kind of notes to it. And I think, what I, from what I've been told, I've never actually bitten on a piece of wormwood before, but supposedly those are the type of flavor characteristics you get from it. Also, I think this one in particular, I think I gave you a little much there. That's okay. But this thing in particular too, I want to say it might have been aged in some sort of like oak barrel or whatever, and I'm getting those, like vanilla spirit uh, notes to it. Yeah, it's powerful. All over. All now, over. I'm only gonna I'm only gonna talk about absinthe for just a second because I want to mm. make sure we can get to our other cocktails. But um, one really cool thing that you can do with absinthe, a lot of people like to drink absinthe. Oh uh, yeah, like straight. One thing you can do with absinthe is if you drip water into a, a good glass of absinthe. I don't know if this one will do it. Oh, you actually have one. You have I do. Yeah, one. actually, we did a stream a few months ago where we were taking various different techniques of being able to drink the sugar, basically the diluted sugar cube method yeah. of absinthe where you either drip the absinthe right on top you can set it ablaze you can just let it go you can yeah. do cold water you can do warm water and you can use this little absinthe spoon as you that's cool sit the sugar cube up on top and you can use various different pipe it me mechanisms to kind of very slowly but surely destroy the sugar cube up on top and it's really interesting i did my when we did that it was with brown sugar cubes and it brought a whole different angle to the drink also we set it on fire, the other, and that was cool. The other cool, I don't know if you saw this when you did it on your stream, but if you mm -hmm. drip water into, like, either with your sugar cube or just dripping water mm -hmm. um, into a uh, absinthe glass, you can you can um, notice it. It, it cloud, it gets cloudy. Yeah. So it turned, it actually turns like a completely clouded color. It does. Um, it's really really cool. <clears throat> yeah, I think so I managed to get a couple of nice like up and up and close zoom shots in that one stream. It's, I don't remember how long ago it was, yeah. but in any case, it was, it's, it's it was very, very cool. It's very cool. And uh, one other fun fact, you can do that with any spirit that uh, is uh, very uh, viscous like that. Mm. So absinthe is kind of viscous. It, it kind of um, is. Another one uh, is Sambuca. Oh or, yeah. Or, Actually, I got a little bit of Sambuca yeah. somewhere right here so too. So Sambuca does the exact same thing. So mm. if you drip water into Sambuca, it turns, it turns like blue. That's cool. I didn't know and that. It's a clear. It's a clear alcohol by itself, but the emulsion breaks once you put it in. It turns. I can. Clear. I can attest to the viscosity of absinthe. I had a keyboard that used to attach to my computer over here, and during a completely separate recording of something completely unrelated to that particular stream, um, I got absinthe literally all over the keyboard. Um, <clears throat> the keyboard does not work anymore. All right, it's on the floor somewhere. Let's stir this one up, huh? I think I will do this one. Absinthe, go away. And then for the glass, what would the glass would like to do? Well, let's see. We should do two. We, I've got some nice, like, kind of koopy kind oh, of yeah, porcelain glasses down there. Coops. If you want to go, I, I like Let's the one see. second to the far right. These ones looks pretty good. Yeah, I like that one in particular. Let's get two of these. So there we go. Both try this. 
What was your, what was this this uh, individual? The Green again? Fairy. I, I met you. Imichao. 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 Did that answer your question earlier about the fortified spirits? I forgot to forgot to follow up on that. Oh yeah. Well, I, I believe, think there's there's yeah. probably a good number of spirits out there as well that are also fortified. And as then well. ice, please. Ice. Okay. I'm gonna big cube. Kind of cube size you're looking for. I would like a big cube, and I'll crack it. Large cube. I'm a I'm a big fan of that. Actually, can you hold the book for just a moment while I go and acquire the cube? Yes. So any other questions on the stream while we are getting ice here? Here is my cube. I'm going to pass yes, that there for a second. Yes, it answered my question very thoroughly. Thank you. You are very welcome. Okay. All right. Cube. So what we're going to do, we're going to do the, the classic. If you want to switch over to this here. Oh, yeah. yeah this is cool. You, that setup is nice. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna, let, me, let me switch spots with you, and we'll try to get a more flattering yeah. angle to All it. Right, so this gonna, thing is a lot more. So what I'm going to do is break the ice in here. It's a little slippery. There we go. One more crack. Eric's a lot more proficient at cracking ice cubes. I am very afraid and I often make a mess with it. And if you had to make a recommendation, is it about the force that you hit it with? Because I feel like I always make a mess with it. It's not the force, it is the impulse. Mm. So And angle, angle too, it's gotta yeah. be important. Well, the long spoon gives you torque to, yeah. hit, to hit it with, right? And then uh, just as long as you hit it like abruptly, it doesn't have to be really hard, but it's just gotta be an abrupt hit. I like doing this because the, the cubes stay bigger, so you can control the dilution a lot better. You really don't want to use the ice cubes that like come out of your refrigerator because nah. they just dilute the drink way too fast. That's true. And then one way you can test these is to to look at the side of the glass, and when the glass starts frosting, that's when it's good. So it's almost there. Mm -hmm. It's getting close. I also kind of like to use a little knuckle thing. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's any science in this at all, but I feel like... I can feel on the tip of my knuckle when it's just chilled enough where they's like it's just starting to condensate on the outside. That looks, that looks good to me. Yeah, if you can see it's starting to condense a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, a little bit so, on the top. So that's pretty good. Alright, so now, uh, trivia question, which strainer are we using for this? We just talked about this about 20 minutes ago, Cam. I think we're probably going to use a julep strainer. We're going to use a julep strainer, and why is that? We're going to use the julep strainer because that's more for your spirit forward cocktails. You don't have any Correct. sort of pulp and stuff in there. <clears throat> just trying to let it pass through. So I'm going to go ahead and strain this, and if you would not mind zesting uh, a, a lemon peel for me. Or actually, two little lemon peels. Let's go for that. You want me to zest it or you want me to express the peel? Uh, get a, get a, a piece of peel for us. Peel. This is like just quite not the right size. Be a little careful with this one. So we're gonna divvy this up into two glasses. This actually is a really pretty looking cocktail. Something fell down there. That's fine. It's okay. That's actually a very pretty looking cocktail. It's nice looking. So I I have let's had let's put the angle back up again and get a nice little look at. So that. I have had this cocktail at some point. Um, and it was pretty good. I remember. All right. So a peel. La last thing we're gonna do. Stay up. Stay up here for just one sec. Yeah. So uh, what we're gonna do for the peel? We got a nice piece uh, about I'd say like a thumbs width wide. That was a, a good peel that he took. Um, to express it, we're actually gonna hold it like a, like a sandwich, and we're just gonna go bam, and you can actually see the oils go when oh, I yeah. when I express. So I'm gonna go bam, bam, all right? And then, like I said before, wipe the rim of the glass. That gives a little bit of extra oil. Um, you could put it in the glass. I'm not gonna put it in just because we only have one, but mm -hmm. um, you can do either. Just be aware that if, uh, I'm gonna show on the back of the camera real quick here. Yeah. There's a lot of pith on this piece of peel. Mm -hmm. Where's that out there? You guys see all this white right here? I think that. Yeah. yeah, it's a little hard to see, but this, um, there's the camera. So there's a lot of white on this peel. That is called the pith mm -hmm. of a lemon. Uh, and it's on any citrus fruit, actually, like oranges and everything. There's always some sort of pithy layer there. Uh, that is very bitter. Um, and if you leave that sit in your drink for too long, it'll actually make your drink pretty bitter. Mm -hmm. um, it'll, it'll leach into the drink yeah. itself. So um, when it, this, is, this goes for cooking, too. You don't want to include this white part whenever you're zesting something. So if you're ever zesting like for, for cooking purposes, don't ever go into that white mm -hmm. layer. Just just get the colored layer I on the top. the surface, zest it a bit. Don't go too far. Wait. All right. So, Cam, we are about to drink Jerry Thomas's improved, improved cocktail. cocktail from 18... 60 something. 60 something. I can't remember now. We're farther <laughs> in history than we were previously. Cheers. It's not bad. Right off the bat, mm. those lemon oils are so pleasant. This is actually super interesting because the flavor I'm getting, I honestly thought it would be more maraschino y, but I think it's actually playing really well with the absinthe there. It's, it's noticeable. Mm. It really is. Yeah, and we added the perfect amount of absinthe because you can taste it, but it's not overwhelming. Ooh, yeah. Absinthe is, um, 
if anybody likes to cook or eat, which is most people in the world like to eat, um, truffle oil is very similar to absinthe. Really? Um, in in not in its flavor because they taste very different. I was gonna say like you, get, you gotta leave truffle, me down this one. The reason I said that truffle oil is one of those things that is delicious if you use it sparingly right. but if you use too much of it it completely overwhelms anything you have i've had like a good many number of truffle chips before and i love the flavor of truffle so i don't mind it but whenever we wind up bringing it home it's like it's like this is it's so it's so obviously truffle but i, I had a uh, you know that italian place down the street that we talk about all the time mm. um we went there like three three weeks ago or two weeks ago um and i got mm. a uh, truffle martini there. So, Ooh, it was a mar so it was a martini that had olives that were um, soaked Ooh, in like a truffle oil. That sounds good. And it was it was interest it was good, but it was too truffly. Mm -hmm. Like the interesting. It was, it was way too truffly. So that, that's an interesting point there. So they they must have taken the olives and put it into the truffle oil. I guess they did. They <laughs> use like the brine for the drink as well. They, they, they must have because it was like otherwise. It, I feel like that it tasted it tasted like from. drinking a truffle. Oh my goodness! It was like it was way too strong. Some people are gonna then be like, oh my god, it's the truffle. <laughs> I'm getting all my money's but, worth out of it, but this is a cocktail podcast, though. So, um, I had I had to connect it somehow, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> but uh, truffle cocktail ab absinthe is I'm, that is true. What I'm saying, like absinthe, is something that you need to use sparingly in a cocktail because otherwise yeah. it will only taste like absinthe. Yeah, I mean, you can take there. There's a couple of cocktails out there where you can just use like let's say entire ounces and whatnot mm. of the absinthe, but like unless you've got something else that's equally strong and potent, balancing it out, it can to that point get really overpowering so another couple notes on this we chilled it perfectly yeah this there's is a the nice exact there's a nice dilution. condensation collecting on yeah. the side of the glass there yeah and, yeah you can show them in your little camera if you want to Ooh, yeah. i don't know if you'll be able to see it it's kind of hard to see but give it a check it is that we chilled it exactly perfect oh yeah um, it's cold but it's not like ice cold and i think that's the general rule of thumb you want for most of your cocktails is like you want them cold but not ice cold mm -hmm. there's only a few cocktails that you want like legitimately ice cold uh, and a Negroni is one of them, actually. Yeah, and I think I remember like reading through a little bit of Liquid Intelligence. I think there was a reason for the reason you don't want mm -hmm. it's super duper. Well, cold cold suppresses flavors. That was the so one. That was you, the one. If you eat leftovers out of your fridge, they always taste uh, less flavorful mm -hmm. and less salty than because the cold when they're heated. Just sapped all the flavor from it. Same thing with uh, salt levels. So mm -hmm. if you if you uh, like drink a cold beverage that is salted mm -hmm. that, or that has salt in it, yeah, it will taste less flavorful than if you have it hot because mm -hmm. salt comes through more when uh, a, a I'm beverage thinking, is hot. I'm thinking of a chilled Gatorade. Yeah, or like, soup, first or like, or like soup, <laughs> soup's a good example too. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Like cold some, soup versus hot soup. Like like com, some hot cold soups are good, soup. but they always taste saltier when they're hotter. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's the same thing with drinks. Some flavors get completely lost when they're ice cold. Mm -hmm. um, oh, whiskey is actually a really good example. Ooh, which, oh yeah, because it's hot right. versus cold. Because a lot Ice of versus otherwise. a lot of whiskeys, uh, not even hot, but just like room temperature whiskey, taste way different than cold whiskey. Oh yeah. Um, so that's why like you never should put your whiskey in the freezer with like your you know four dollar bathtub gin or whatever. That right. You right. Find at parties. Keep them separate from each other. My my fiance still puts bottles of alcohol in the freezer, and I'm like. <laughs> I don't understand why you do The this. only reason I have bottles of alcohol in the freezer is because something would have said, keep this highly chilled, and I know I'm not keeping it in there for more than an hour or so. So other other notes on this, uh, the I think the the sweetness is like perfect. Oh yeah, um, it's I the, agree the, on that. The, the combination of the simple plus the maraschino, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's very, very it's good. beautiful. We, we actually, do we? I don't know, we did use the simple in this one. Mm -hmm. We didn't use the sugar cube. No, yeah, we didn't use the sugar cube. We, we can get in there. Yeah, we'll use that for the next one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is excellent. This is a really good cocktail. It is really, really nice. I like, I think the sweetness is there. I smell the lemon and it's still present as I'm drinking it. The absinthe is just ever, ever so mm. faint there, but not completely unnoticeable. I've actually it's definitely there. It's definitely there though. I'm, I'm like trying to search for the maraschino, but I feel like I have to sift through the absinthe oh, to there. get to there, to get to it. So but it's not in a bad way either. This is one of those drinks that has a long flavor profile. So mm. like you take a sip, it tastes like something immediately, but then as you, as you breathe and like the, the flavors continue to develop in your mouth, you start getting those cherry notes. You know, especially as I, I kind of put my tongue to the roof of my mouth and put downward almost like a vacuuming effect. Mm -hmm. And now up at the top, mm. as I breathe, it's very, very maraschino y. Yeah. But at first, the sweetness feels almost absent, kind of that liquid and then, flavor. And then the other thing I was going to mention is you can definitely see how a more juniper region would not work with this mm -hmm. because. Um, I feel like the flavors would just be like it'd, it'd be, be too it'd be too botanical, mm -hmm. right? Because we already have the absinthe in there, which kind of has a botanical got, quality to it. Plain. So if you add the gin uh, that has the very junipery flavor profile, like like a, like a like, drag, like, yeah, like, like yeah. most beef eaters do, 
you would definitely taste it. I mean, there's some there's definitely some gins that are even more junipery than that, but for sure, yeah, Plymouth, which is what we were comparing it to with his recipe, is would is less junipery. Absolutely. So this is a really good drink, and it's pretty too. It looks it almost looks like milk punch, doesn't it? it yeah, like it's like the same, nice same color, color as to milk it. punch. I like I like how it's almost rosy. I've made mm. like rose hip infused tea before, and it's very yes. it's this light like um, brownish pinkish yeah. color. Very nice. All right, Cameron. Any other questions, comments, concerns on the improved cocktail? And the, fan, the fancy cocktail would have been, we would have used the dry curacao. But Correct. I don't even have it a dry curacao. Yeah. So we wouldn't even need well, to try it. I, if, we were gonna make that, sec? if we were going to make that, mm -hmm. I would have brought my dry curacao. I, fair, I do have fair. some in a secret vault. Because that'll be, that'll be safe for another time. Maybe at that point, we can just go through the entire history of the evolution so, of the cocktail and try all of them. So I haven't, I, I was mistaken earlier. I have not, I had not had this one. I mm. had had the, um, the fancy, the fancy one, and I actually don't like the fancy one very much. Interesting, because I had the one because well, I had the one with the dry curacao in it, and it just it tasted way too dry. I can imagine so. Like, yeah, I guess there's this really has, this has more sweetness. The only it. dryness here is probably coming from the absence, and it's really not that noticeable. I don't think it is a very. I'm pleasantly surprised. I actually didn't think this one was going to be all that good, so mm. I'm, I'm pretty impressed. And by I remember this. we put we put some Angostura in this too, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, there's Angostura bitters also. So there's like that's three. Nice. I'm there's getting like, some of that now. Yeah, there's like three very pungent very strong flavors that are working really nicely in harmony here because mm -hmm. any one of those things like the bitters yeah the, the, that's a really um, good point too yeah the, the bitters the absinthe and the maraschino could all be clashing like crazy you're, to you're totally right there now i'm realizing that combined together like they're all mm. balanced that's the right word to use for yeah that's honestly uh the last word we were talking about before mm. that's another drink that kind of uh works in a similar capacity where it's got these very strong liquors in it oh yeah um or liqueurs i should say mm-hmm um, the difference is a last word has chartreuse in it. Yeah, which I don't something think I've you know, never had the pleasure yeah. of trying. One of these days, I'm going to buy a bottle. Maybe I'll buy. Maybe I'll buy a bottle of that soon. Oh my gosh! I've thought I've thought thought about it for a long time, and I've been I I've, I've wanted to. That's it's on my list of like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get it unless I have at least a good repertoire of cocktails I need to try with it. That's a lot of that's a lot of uh, you get a lot of drinks out of that bottle. Oh yeah. We got a comment. It's a hefty one. I have yellow and green and can bring it to a future stream. Please, Brad. Please Ooh. do so. <laughs> Yeah, I, that could be a nice that could be a nice theme for that one. If you could comment, I actually don't know the difference between yellow and green chartreuse in terms of flavor. I, I know they look different, obviously. I, and say, I know like, they're the, used the in color not enough for you. I know they're used in different cocktails, but do you actually know uh, what like the flavor difference between the two is? Because yeah. I've, I've never tried chartreuse. And then I wonder too, like you know, you have the difference between like your blue curacao, dry curacao, orange curacao, whatever, and like well, blue, the different blue, blue is just, just blue, it's, blue, not blue, a, it's not an yeah, orange at all. Blue curacao is for like hurricanes at mm -hmm. Joe's Crab Shack. Oh, like, look, it looks like the ocean. <laughs> Which Yellow is, is sweeter, green is more aggressively herbal okay that's good like to know that. nice nice good very good. good all righty mr cameron i think we are ready to move on to our next cocktail we gotta move on to the next one but first first we finished that one that was a that was a good drink like that was good enough that i would make that again one of the reasons i'm thoroughly appreciating this stream right now is that just the other day I got a new cocktail book, and the thing that really, really hyped me up about this particular book was that it had an entire section in it on classic cocktails. Cocktails that, I mean, when I think classic, I think of something that it had an entire history behind it to allow it to grow and evolve and to come to like some sort of steady equilibrium where people can play around with it, I'm sure, but there's like this sweet spot that it's landed in and it likes to stay there at almost this optimal zone and i want to try more cocktails like that because i feel like if, if you were to compare it go back to the uh, music analogy if you're like classically trained that's a completely different thing than being like jazz trained and i feel like if i had to do that analogy a very jazz trained when it comes to cocktails and i need to start gaining an appreciation for the more in this case, things. no pun intended, intended <laughs> finer, more classical things. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of violins and orchestras every once in a while instead of a bunch of trumpets, jazz, saxophones, and swung pianos, which I appreciate all of them. All right, Actually, Cameron. before the stream started, Eric was playing some sweet tunes on a synthesizer I finally got plugged in right beside the desk. I'm working on my own <laughs> piano skills, yeah, too. Yeah, I have, I have started recently learning how to play piano, uh, which has been... A very fun journey. Yeah, and you say like you just started learning how to play piano. You were playing like straight up chords and singing the song <laughs> and stuff, and just like oh, technically, yeah, started... I've had my hands on a piano for many, many years now, and I can barely play my scales. I bought a I bought a piano like three weeks, ago, three and a half weeks ago. There we and go. that was uh, <laughs> that was I started playing. I've I've I've, I've, I've moved along quickly. I'm happy with it, You're, but it's uh, yeah, yeah. I it's fun. I've been enjoying. Oh yeah. a lot. Hey, let me do a little bit of this uh, clean up and yes. change up our cocktail on the board back there. Alrighty. Would you like to share some of the what what, what trick are we doing next, Eric? Well, uh, as mentioned in the in the uh, chat earlier, 
um, there's a logical progression from the plain and the fancy and the improved cocktail, which we just worked on, uh, all the way up to the Sazerac. And that is the next cocktail that we're gonna be doing. Now that's actually quite a lot of the same ingredients that we've been using, but it's it's uh, added to the, to the drink in a much different way. Mm -hmm. And you end up getting a really different flavor profile, which I'm pretty excited to, to, to talk with oh you guys goodness, about. Yeah. And even my own personal experience with the Sazerac so far is one of the first drinks that I ever had when I was out at an official bar, I walked up to the bartender, I was like, I want a Sazerac because somewhere in my bartending travels, somebody said, Sazeracs are really, really unique. You should have one. And I was like, I gotta try this thing. And I was not expecting what it was that I had. At the time, I was like, this tastes disgusting. It tastes straight up like whiskey. And what the hell is that other weird note to it that I would later learn to be absinthe yes. and Angostura bitters, honestly. Well, and it shouldn't have been Angostura though. Oh, oh yeah. Use yeah. page, page outs with, oh, with Sazerac. That's the one. Yeah. That, but, that was the one specifically. But, I think afterwards I was like, it was the page outs specifically. Yeah. And I was like, this almost smells, at the time, I was like, this smells like a wet dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I drank that. I was like, this is weird. So we will get it. We will get into this a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I, I think, I think the, the story of the Sazerac is very interesting. Um, but basically, the Sazerac was originally from New Orleans. Uh, and let me find the year. I think Sazerac is its own company, right? Yeah, so Sa Sazerac is the name of a bar. Mm, uh, oh, I that, see. that was that was kind of where the where it came from. Nice. Uh, the name the name of the bar. So it was very like late 1800s, early 1900s is when the Sazerac came around. So this was quite a few years after sort of these Jerry Thomas cocktails, the the improved cocktail, the fancy cocktail. Um, were roughly you know 20 years or so yeah. after, after those came out because those are right around like the you know 1860s 1870s now we're right into like 1895 like to 1900 ish like right around that range that's where the sazerac comes from continue to travel up the chronology of it all yes so and yeah we've been kind of moving in a somewhat chronological order we skipped all of the flips and the whiskey smashes and stuff because i frankly think those are kind of gross i don't really like <laughs> i don't i don't like those i've made a few flips in my life there are and some, I, there are I some don't think they're good palatable sides of the cocktail history and they stuff, taste not like so palatable sides they, as well. flips taste like alcoholic milkshakes that are not sweet which like you think you might think sounds good, but they're really not. I hope like, I spelled Sazerac <laughs> correctly. I think you did. Do a good job there. S A Z S A Z E R A C. Yep. It's working. You got it. Very good. Perfect. Yes, the Sazerac. Okay. So, um, we are. There's a lot of ways that you can make a Sazerac. Honestly, um, every bar kind of has their own way of approaching it. Mm. There are a couple things that are very consistent in all Sazeracs, though. One is absinthe rinse mm -hmm. so you're not adding absinthe to the cocktail itself you're rinsing you're rin a you, glass you rinse it. the glass mm -hmm. one of my best friends from back home her family uh loves sazerac's like that's kind of like their family's drink interesting sazerac's and her dad to this day still makes the best sazerac Ooh. i've ever had in my life um i don't remember what uh alcohol he uses now mm -hmm. to be honest um, we're going to be using rye today. That's yeah. like one of the options you have. You can technically do this with bourbon. You can do it with Canadian whiskey if you wanted. Yeah, yeah. Um, I rye is kind of a more traditional whiskey to use this to do this with. But um, I'm, I'm curious to see how, bunch. based off of how the improved cocktail went, that the rye rye whiskey has a more distinct taste to it, and I want to see how that yeah. plays with the absinthe specifically in this case. And uh, we're going to be using Rittenhouse Bonded today. Oh, yeah. um, we talked on our last stream about what Bonded. Uh, alcohols. I mean, let's let's pull this up for a sec because I think this is go. worth discussing again. Um, so, That's bottled right. and bond uh, is a specific moniker for uh, alcohols that are bottled with a very specific uh, regulation mm -hmm. associated with it. Um, they usually have to come from uh, a single run of whiskey, so it can't be blended. Right, it has to be um, a particular, I guess you could call it single malt in this case, or? Uh, no, because that's that's more of the mash bill. Mm, I see, um, okay. This is more of just like a batch I made. It's yeah. Got, it's gotta come from like this batch. It can't come from two different batches, it's yeah, all from the like, same the one. Yeah, the big, like, you look at like, the big Jack Daniels facilities and whatnot, yes. for the most part what they do, unless they're making one of their single barrel mm -hmm. whiskeys, they'll take a lot of batches and mix them to get the flavor to be consistent across. That's which is, fair, which evens is, it out. Which is a good thing, right? Yeah. But, but uh, that that's not what you what you do for bottled and bond. Mm -hmm. um, the other big thing with bonded rye specifically, but any bonded alcohol, is they're higher proof. So uh, 100 proof so, in this case, right? So straight up 50%. Proof. So most whiskeys are 80 proof, mm -hmm. which means they're 40% alcohol. Um, bottled and bond, it has to be 100 proof. That's like the, the regulation, you cannot mark it Mm -hmm. a bonded uh, alcohol 
as uh, bonded if it's not 100 proof. And I forget, did we did we cover whether or not like to get to that particular proof, they, can they like not cut it at all? Yeah, they can't. Well, I imagine they probably can't do much cutting, if anything at all. You can get it high. You with can, water. You can have it be higher mm -hmm. and then bring it down, but you can't add alcohol to it. Right, right. right so you can't like... Because that would be mis mixing everything together. Exactly. And at that point, it wouldn't be bottled. Yeah, and bond. It, it tastes bad if they do that anyways, right? Mm -hmm. But some companies do do that like there will like some especially vodka companies will do mm -hmm. that where they'll they'll have a base spirit that they distill and then if they need if they need to increase the alcohol content they'll mm -hmm. add additional ethanol to it interesting interesting yeah so one of my buddies used to work in an ethanol plant that was actually one of the That's main, some good context main, main places they sold it to were alcohol distribution companies mm -hmm. and um, i remember seeing it was I, I don't know anything about this but like the idea that like certain certain distillers will take like their own base spirit and they'll sell it to other places and they will add their own stuff to it and call it basically their own yeah like somebody's selling like some sort of like vodka base or whiskey base out there and you're, somebody else is adding their own like little bit to it yeah um because they i guess maybe they can't produce in that quantity or they have a particular flavor that they're trying to tail off of yeah I don't know. Interestingly, Bottle and Bond actually came out of the Prohibition era mm. um, because they wanted people uh, to be, uh, after after Prohibition, they wanted people to be producing alcohol that had very sp specific specifications associated with it so people mm. knew what they were buying. Yeah. Um, it was almost like a certificate of authenticity. You could yeah. Of, I mean, um, I feel bonded, like there's, for, for there's this big alcohol. idea now that like when you go to the store and you buy something with a particular brand label on it, you see a particular label, for example, in this case, the Bottle and Bond, you want to know like exactly what that means so that there's no like random surprises or stuff yeah yeah it says on the bottle bottled in bond under u.s government supervision which is exactly it says to meet the strictest requirements the written house you enjoy today carries forth carries forth the distinct and spicy flavor profile link distinguished long ago so ba basically the the long story short you don't need to know the details of what mm -hmm. bottle and bond is just know it's higher proof and it's more flavorful mm -hmm. and that's that's one of the reasons if, if for any basically any recipe you're making yeah if you can get a bonded uh alcohol to use use Go it for it higher proof spirits one uh up the proof of the drink which is a good thing yep because it, it's good to have a stronger drink generally yeah and you um, can you can always like dial down on the i guess alcohol proportion by adding other stuff as well yeah well and the the whole point i was making earlier is like the the proof of a drink actually affects the flavor of it because yeah. it affects like how you're tasting it in your mouth so higher proof drinks make you taste the flavors of the of the actual spirit oh, more that's actually even more interesting yeah I feel like if you had like more, let's say, ethanol in the drink, that it would almost because like it's the evaporatory processes that it would yeah. almost dull in your, ta your I should, ability to I taste. I should. I should know the answer to that, but I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know the answer. Intuitively, it doesn't make <laughs> sense, but like there's another, there's like a history kind of documentary type book yeah. on cocktails that I have and it's called drink and it says specifically oh, one of the first like pages of the book and it caught, caught me completely off guard is like yeah ethanol in its most pure quantities a hundred percent is actually very sweet to the human taste bud however you know it evaporates so damn quickly that it's just pain yeah however you know it, by that logic that actually kind of tracks yeah and I'm a I'm a biomedical engineer so I should know the answer to that, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay um if they use electricity in the distillation process yes. that's that's more up my alley so so these taste a lot better, so you'll get more of the rye flavor in this drink, which is a good thing because rye with this combination of the other ingredients is really good. I'm looking forward to okay. it. Okay, so that's the first ingredient for a Sazerac. The second is absinthe, which we we already have. We got we got some. Pull, uh, pull that back up. Vio okay. So we're gonna do that in a minute. We're not gonna we're not gonna deal with it quite yet. We already had a good discussion on absinthe. We Let's did pass that. Uh, let's talk about Paige Houds bitters. Mm, yes, indeed. So, Actually, I'm very, very curious about this because, again, one of my first impressions with it was with the Sazerac, and I remember taking a, sm a smell of it now, and I'm actually curious if we want to try a little bit of this, too. Will, yeah. Because... What's, what's my motto? Try all your ingredients. Try it all. Because <laughs> originally when I smelled this... I was like, this smells like a wet dog. And I think this is probably the same bottle of Peshaud's Bitter that I had in my collection that I had originally because I was like, I don't know what the heck, like, I, I don't know enough about it. And to be honest, I feel like it doesn't get used as often as it could to really be that able to explore stink. it. The best, way to, the best way to try bitters is actually to mix it with a little bit of water. Yeah, because it's too it's it's oh, too yeah. strong by itself. Actually, what I've done what I've done recently is I have quite a few bitters behind my bar over here, yeah, and good. I would find that whoops, all right, that I'll actually take my glass of water and I'll put the bitters in it just to see if I can get any of the components from it. And it's been a nice way to explore the bitters a little bit more. Yeah, like what? It's almost cleanery, you yeah. know? Yeah. So Page Page House bitters to me. 
Hi Cameron, how many new cocktails are you going to make? Says Kylie19983. How many new cocktails? Let's see. So far, we've made two so we've far. We've made two, two so far. The punch one was new. The improved cocktail I've ever had. I've had a Sazerac before. And then, what's the next? Gibson? Yeah, a Gibson is So last. two new cocktails this evening. But the, but the future holds is something else entirely. Yeah, so Page House, Page House bitters to me are less aromatic than Angostura. Yeah. But still just as bitter. Ooh, you know. There's something more fruity about that now. Yeah. Now that it's been diluted, yeah. I think the Angostura feels very, very spicy, very yeah, I mean, cinnamony. Can, yeah, we, we can compare. Uh, Peixe here. not as much. Almost, almost more kind of, almost grapefruity, almost. It's orange bitters. It's other, another. That's an old-fashioned one, the Angostura. Or the Angostura. Put, Angostura. Oh, there you yeah, are. I put, I put okay, them right so over here. Dump your water out there. I'm going to drink right. the rest of the Charles. Mmm. Good stuff. I got a little bit of water over here. Are you going to make any drinks for Valentine's Day? Yes, and I have a very, very special plan for it as well. Stick around for it. I encourage you. Actually, I'll spoil it now. X-rated drinks. Tune in next week. Oh, I'm the, not the not the. We're trying. We're trying to, we're trying trying to, to store it now. So you can immediately you. see the color difference there. Oh if yeah. You put that one on is the screen. one is like. All right. Let me, let me bring this up. We've got one that is a lot more. Oh, did that all work? There we go. <laughs> Yeah, one I think is your your comment on like the cinnamon notes is definitely accurate. Mm -hmm. I think. And I didn't like for for I didn't notice that until a lot longer. So this is the color of the Angostura bitters. It's a little more orangey from here, but although it's mixed with a little bit of water, but the Pichaud's bitters is like a they're like red. dark like crimson color on the inside. I'm not sure if that's super visible, but oh yeah, there right like there. The comparison versus the Angostura, which has a very dark bottle, so I can't quite do the comparison justice. However, I'm a I'm a big fan. Um, if, I, if you guys don't ever like, sometimes you don't want an alcoholic drink when you're out, just mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Yeah, you can get bitters and you can get bitters and soda, and that's a really good non-alcoholic drink. Really cool things. The bitters are kind of floating on top of my water right now. It's actually really cool looking. It's a nice float. I don't know if you can see that. It looks like a, a New York sour kind of, with the, like the with the wine float. There we go. That's actually really cool looking. Yeah, I love that. All right, all right. Love the colors. That's density. I think I, I think I lost your place in the book. I apologize. That's for that. okay. I will refine it. That's why I put the little, the little. Uh, oh yeah. Book. Angostura, dry, cinnamony, like very almost hey, Christmas like. Hey, Chouch is Chouch more Chouch's fruity. Fruit. Yeah, and it, it it has a bit of an orangey quality to it. Yeah, I want I want to call it grapefruit, but I had I had I had my first sip of Amaro Nonino the other day. Oh yeah, that's, that's very good. very grapefruity. I would say, as as compared to other Amaros. It doesn't really say. It doesn't really say what. Yeah, I guess could you could you exactly. call it a little? I mean, it's red, so could we safely say that there might be some cherry notes in there? Yeah, probably. This is fruitier. Fruitier in general is what I would say. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have talked about we're not going to use any stir for this drink. We use page mm -hmm. outs. Um, this is one of the few drinks that actually calls for page outs. There's not a whole lot yeah, of drinks. Yeah, there aren't too many of them. Angostura is kind of the the gold standard across the board. Remember, you use bitters like salt. That's kind of the idea with with improve using bitters. the flavor, Im enhance it. Quick question from Kylie. What is your favorite drinks? And angst with an X. Favorite drinks with an X? Drinks with an X? Favorite drinks? I like mm. the Mockingbird. It's a pun. Tequila Mockingbird. It's a book I've never read. <laughs> Quick answer there. Atticus Finch. That's true. <laughs> um, okay. So, what we're going to do, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read, I actually, this is a good uh, segment to read. Absolutely, the yeah, the Sazerac so, is a, has a very, very loaded history content. So, David Wondrich has a, a good section that he talks about the, the notes on the ingredients for this one. So, we're going to use a sugar cube for mm -hmm. this recipe, and Cam actually made some sugar Yeah, I, I tried, my method was thus, I put sugar into cubular container, and I added just enough water to keep the adhesion together, and out of about three dozen sugar cubes, I wound up with eight of them. So it's not a good process. I'm looking to improve upon that. But they're they're nice, nice set of cubes, and they sound wonderful. So uh, I'm just going to read this section quickly because I think, I think no, this is absolutely. Good to talk about. This is a really good example of how there's differences in these recipes, and so you just need to kind of adjust it to what you like. Yeah. So the sugar cube, which we're going to be using here, is traditional. Um, I've always found though that this drink responds ex exceptionally well to a scant teaspoon of gum syrup, which is um, it's basically like a thicker. Uh, simple syrup that I has like more of a it has more of a mouth feel to it. Mm -hmm. Something um, I've always wanted to try. Yeah, it's it's okay. I, I think it's kind of overrated in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, hmm. but it's, respect it. it. It tastes it's the same sweetness and it's just like more expensive than sugar. You know. Yeah. So, um, but we're gonna use the sugar cube for this one. Um, as for the rye, 
Uh, the real stuff is at present irrecoverable because um, they originally called for Maryland rye, which is a... Is that a thing still? It's, it's, nobody makes it anymore. Mm. It was a very specific type of rye whiskey with a really specific mash bill that mm -hmm. just nobody makes anymore. I'm so unfortunate. Um, so... Uh, Maybe some small distiller The six-year-old rye that the Sazerac mm. company makes at the time of this printing, which was 2015 because this is a... a, a, a newer a, printing in the book. Newer printing in the book. Uh, does a fine job, as does the bonded Rittenhouse rye, which is exactly what we're going to be making. That this is the best rye for cocktails. I love bonded it is, Rittenhouse. It is so often called that specifically. As I've been I got doing you, more, I, I got you to buy it. It's true. It's true for the for the um, we were doing the Manhattan for Manhattan, and it is. And I told you, I'm like, oh this my makes, god, so good. This, this makes the best Manhattan. Do you remember my uh, my chocolate Manhattan? Oh my Manhattan? god, I'm still talking. Actually, the other day, um, there's another cocktail streamer out there. He's Kalino Twelve. I'll give him a shout out in a moment. He was doing a little bit of a kind of giveaway show because. He just reached 2,000 followers the other day, and I actually won a uh, thing of mole bitters from him. Oh, and nice. I'm so yeah. looking forward to making one of those. Yeah, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll re give you the recipe. Please that's, do. That's Please one of my do. favorite cocktails. But Rittenhouse, oh gosh, Ritten, yeah. Rittenhouse Bonded is like the secret to good Manhattans. That and the uh, Carpano Antica Vermouth. Yeah. Which is the, that vermouth is just fantastic. I'll real quick give Colino 12 out there a shout out because he, he most definitely deserves it a lot. A lot of really good stuff happening over there. Yes. Insp inspiration for everything that happens here too. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention, if you don't have Bond and Rittenhouse, another really good rye for this cocktail is Old Overholt, which is- Overholt? I did see that in there and I've never, yeah. I've never heard of that So before. I've seen, they have it at most of the liquor stores. Um, oh yeah? That's actually a very common one down in New Orleans where they make this uh, traditionally. You said it was Overholt? Um, let, me yeah, grab, old, let me grab one of my markers old, over there and write that down. Old Overholt. It's, a, I, it, it's good. It's I don't like it as much as Rittenhouse, honestly, but it's, it's still good. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other comment uh, that a lot of people differ on with Sazerac, and I'm curious in chat if uh, any of you guys make Sazerac, if you do one or the other here. Some people like to use a combination of Page House and Angostura. Yeah, I did notice that as a comment in there yeah. too. And so I have seen uh, both people do it. My my friend who makes amazing Sazerac only uses Page House. Mm. I have also seen people make it with both. Um, it never doesn't have Page House. So like yeah, it's got to have it in there it. at least a little. Um, in a little bit. But, I've seen the mixture, so I'm curious uh, in chat if we've, any we've of you guys have actually got a quick happened. question on yes. the old, which old overhold Holt? Basically, only more than awesome, Brad will usually only use the Rittenhouse rye, but I guess, are there multiple types of old overholds it, uh, out there? Or? So, I, I know I've seen, like, I think they have, like, single barrel and stuff, too. Oh, I see, um, I see. It, it says Could in you here. Do, you do a bonded, I suppose? Yeah, I don't know if they have a bonded. <laughs> that's a that's a good question. Not every company does a bonded because mm -hmm. it, it requires a certain Ooh, like which year, multiple years. Perhaps. Oh, yeah, I don't uh, hmm. I I don't know to be I totally know. honest. It says um it says in here most people use plain old old overhold. Plain so, old old old. So I would say I would say the cheapest version of it is probably fine, but. Yeah. On, 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 obviously, if you're trying to level up. Yeah, I yeah. wonder if this will be like. Obviously, if you get nicer, you... if you get nicer overhaul, it's gonna be good. I, mm. I don't, I. It's not like a scotch where like the the flavor will like mm -hmm. be dramatically different. Um, but any older whiskey scotch is really good. Scotch is a large, deep and murky yeah. hole. That I, I don't, I don't like scotch very much to be honest. I tried a lot of them one time. My buddy, we were we were go doing some traveling. And it was just like he was he was flexing his wealth on us, and so we went to the store and bought some Lagavulin, and I was like, this is. A different flavor it's yeah. like paint varnish and he's like you're right okay so let's start make yeah so i out to answer your question i think any of the old overholts would be fine um might I, as well just pick one and see what works yeah yeah i mean you can't go wrong with it and my, generally my my opinion on aged whiskeys in cocktails is that you are usually if it's like a really expensive one you're wasting the 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 yeah the, i feel like the, the good whiskey and i the feel content. like i feel like rarely what you if it's a really really old whiskey with a lot of those components to it you're probably just better sipping on it yeah because take, take it simply what aging does is like it gives a lot more nuanced flavors and like deep like mm -hmm. deeper it's they're deeper but they're like very nuanced flavors yeah. and, and if so, you're mixing it with something else like there's a chance that those really really deep flares that you wouldn't be able to appreciate unless it was on its own and you do like the different blooming techniques and different yeah. temperatures and stuff it just kind of gets it could get lost if you are curious about techniques for drinking whiskey check out the vod from the uh thanks mrs stream yeah it's the 20 it's part part one of the 24 hour stream there should be a chapter that for whiskey tasting specifically yeah and we that was that was really cool that did, was a completely that was a completely eye-opening session yeah. for me it was really really cool <laughs> that was very like off the cuff too like we weren't planning on doing that we, we just, just did kinda, it anyway. we just kind of honestly did that i'll admit that that part of the stream is a little hazy for me because i think it was kind of later into things and i do recall while glenn and i were playing gamecube after the fact i was most definitely sobering up throughout the night because yeah. we were doing we a drank lot of we, stuff. we drank a lot well and we make so much we made so much fish house punch oh my <laughs> god and i was still <laughs> drinking it all right, let us begin the with Sazerac. Sazerac. So 
Um, the recipe in uh, this book calls for frappeing an old-fashioned glass, Frappy. which 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 basically is taking crushed ice and putting it in the glass. We're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I am a very firm believer that that is not a good way to do a Sazerac because this is, should be a very spirit-forward cocktail, and you don't want that much dilution. All the dilution so, is just going to distract you. So what we're going to do, Cam, if you have a glass that will fit one of your big cubes, let's use that. Hmm. Like a, a rocks glass. Let's see. Yeah, we'll go with we'll go that, for the rocks glass. That one, that one definitely. That that wine glass definitely we'll wouldn't some, work. Do some matching. Yeah, that'll that'll work. That'll work perfectly. Okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna rinse the glass with the absinthe. Okay. So the reason we do this is remember how we were talking about our last cocktail. Mm -hmm. if, you put, if you put too much absinthe into a drink, it's very overwhelming. Yeah, and um, I think we only added about a couple drops to the last one. We added so two drops to two that drops. last And it was still, cocktail, you could still, and you still taste, taste it. And you can still yeah. taste it. So what we're gonna do with this, the idea of uh, uh, putting it in the glass uh, to around the, the rim of it. Yeah, actually is that's to, interesting. So the reason you do that is to get the aromatic aspect of the because it kind of concentrates to the center. And well, it's, it's not even that. So it's when you put it in the glass, it's going to be around the rim of the glass on the inside. So when you go to drink, the It'll smell, it up the smell of it. the the smell of the absinthe vaporizing Ooh, on the that's side a of good the glass, it's yeah. going gonna, gonna to go into your mouth nose. It's it's similar to like putting uh, like herbs or something on food, right? Like mm -hmm. it gives you the 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 smell, like, or even our lemon, right? It's, yeah, totally. It, it's very it's, a, it's to a very olfactory. You know, smell and taste are not that. Yeah. Far apart and and we need a very small amount, so that's why we will rinse the glass with it. We need to spread it in the glass. I've even been told too, like it goes a lot into like the various different techniques of like how you go about making the Sazerac too, where you can take, you can put an entire ounce of the stuff in the glass, just swirl the thing around completely and just like chuck the rest of it. And then as you make the rest of it, it kind of like has a similar effect. There's a lot of technique to it too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So what so we're we gonna need, do? We definitely need our pishodes. We need our absinthe. We need our rye. Yeah, you got that dropper thing? Still? Oh yes, yes. I think I put it right back on the. It's right next to the funnel. You can see it kind of poking oh, up in the yeah, back. Yep. Okay, I gave so, it. I gave it a little wash too. So go ahead. Go ahead and put like five or six drops of absinthe into each of those glasses. Let's go for and it. And we'll then do just, a little bit and of then just kind of spin it on the inside. And you can actually. I'll put it up against the other camera angle too to yeah, show actually, show you all kind of what we're going for actually, here. Actually, you probably don't even need that. You probably just put a little splash in like. Yeah, I think around. it's going to be more effort than it's worth. Yeah. And if there's any extra, we can always just, just pour it back in the too. bottle. Cause like, exactly. We're, we're just doing a little rinse. So so pour a little in there, swirl it around and pour it into the other. No, no. So you can just pour it in the other glass. You don't even have to. Oh, that even better. Every better point there. Yeah. So we can we can take this. We're going to give it a give it a check. Yep. Yeah. So basically what I'm doing here, we put the absinthe in the glass and then we're just kind of spinning it. So that's coating the inside of this glass. And you might spill a little bit, and that's okay. That's fine. That's what we got the little mat. All right, and then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna slowly kind of pour it into this one. Good. Well. So smell that, Cam. Just, th this is the idea we're getting at. You smell how Ooh, yeah. Is. So that's the aromatic comp like comp component of it that we're getting. So good. Oops, sorry about that. Man, it's like actually glass. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I don't even know where I got that thing from. I was holding saline solution in it for a while, and then realized I don't need that much saline solution. Yep. Okay. All right. So now Nicely what we're gonna do. Glass. So now, now we're gonna do is put a sugar cube in each of those. I got my little sugar cubes over here. And these ones were made by me. I made them in less than twenty four hours because I tried my best. Honestly, Cam's, Cam is a, uh, a renaissance man. He can do I everything. Try. I try to do whatever <laughs> I can. Honestly, I put sugar into very small ice cube trays that I got from Target. I put a little water in them and I put them in front of, I put these things under a under a heat lamp. I put these things in the cold air. I put these things in the hot air over a 24 hour period and I only got eight sugar cubes out of them. So I must've been doing something wrong. So the sugar right now is very hard and will not mix if we add it. So we need to moisten it, right? Very so what we're gonna there. do, um, usually you have slightly bigger sugar cubes in this, but we're actually we're also just doing like half drinks here. So this yeah, is fine. Be all right. um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put about three dashes of the pay chowds. Actually, I wanna, get a, I wanna get a view of that as yeah. well. So full, Ooh, a full drink, cause we're we're gonna be splitting this drink into two halves. Actually, you know what? We can make two full ones, why not? Yeah, well, you wanna put another sugar cube in there? For yeah, the yeah, put, sweetness? A, put a second sugar cube Let's in. Let's go for it. Cause that, the, these sugar cubes are a little small. You, you, a full size sugar cube that you would buy like at the store for cocktails specifically would be about twice this size. We just are going the homemade route because Cam is amazing. So, oh, you flatter me, sir. So I'm taking my time with this angle here. I'm still I trying just, to get used to it. I would, I would 100 just cheated and used uh, there we go. used syrup because <laughs> this way, this way, this way. 
Trigger cube. There we go. All right. Let's put. Oh, we another. also we also on stream sometime need to talk about honey syrup because honey syrup is very important. Oh my god, it's such a it's such yeah. a thing. Okay, so yo, oh hold up a second, Dom Star in here popping with another tier one sub. That's nine months, dude. Your subscription to this channel is a baby now. It's just been birthed, Dom. Pop. Thank you, sir. I I don't have my I don't have access to my things over here, but here's a here's a fan. Here. There we oh, go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh my god, it's not open. There we go. Dude, Dom's one of our beautiful mods, and he's been around for so long now, and I just, I love that man. I'm just gonna give him that quick old shout out there. Thank you, Dom. As we continue with it. Thanks, Dom. You are, you Thanks, are much, man. You are much appreciated. I don't know if the alert popped up or anything, but that's epic, dude. All right, so you want to be pretty heavy handed with the pay childs in this drink. So, oh, yeah. So I'm gonna do about five dashes. Do we, do we think that it's probably gonna be absorbed by the sugar there? Or more so the absence. It's just it's just a part of the flavor profile of the drink. You want gotta, you want to be pretty in heavy handed. So we're gonna do about five dashes. Three, four, five. And we'll watch and, the other one too. If we and can. you want to get it straight onto the. Let me see if I can get it in here yeah, without hitting my phone. That. One, two, three, four, five. That's a beautiful color. All right. Now <clears throat> we need to crush these uh, up just a little bit. So we can a use muddler. Muddler works yeah, if you want to muddle. Perfect. For this. Let's so go for that. Go ahead and muddle this and. Try not to hit the sides of the glass too much, because again, that's where that that's where the absinthe is. A absinthe aspect. We want to keep that there as much as possible. Yep. So stay towards the middle of the glass. I think that the sugar keeps kind of off to the side. Honestly, yeah. these are pretty. These break apart pretty easily. I'm yeah. actually kind of happy with that. Well, you also you made them from scratch. So that's this also is true. A big part of it. They're very fresh cubes. Yep. Nice. Good. Okay. Uh, next, we're gonna add our. Toss this in the bucket over there. Don't yep. think we we'll need it again. So if you want a two ounce each of these, please. Two ounces each of the Rittenhouse rye. It's about 59-ish milliliters. In the bucket. Yeah, in the bucket. <laughs> Do two ounces over on this bucket side. Disgusting. Oh my god, yeah. No, that's the that's the what is it, honorary bucket? That's what I was calling it last the honor, week. The honor bucket. Yeah, the honorary bucket. If you do anything to the bucket, it's an honor for the bucket itself, not for you. There we go. <laughs> Ooh. All right. And then Gee, I love that color there so yeah, far. So my goodness. Let me tilt this just a little bit so you guys can see. So that is that's what you want to be seeing when you're making a Sazerac. It should be kind of orangey red in that's color. It's a beautiful color, yeah, my goodness. That's that's hundred percent what it's supposed to be. Yeah. That's um, awesome. Okay, so let's switch back to our big yeah. screen here for a moment. And um, we're back. So now we basically have the cocktail built at this point. There's no more ingredients that are going to go into it aside from a little bit of lemon at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but we're actually going to stir this in the glass. So if this is an interesting cocktail that you build in the glass. Old fashions you can do this with too, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and some people will like want to put the ice in first. I actually don't like doing that because I feel like the sugar sticks to it. <laughs> when yeah, you that's do a that. good point. Honestly, um, the 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 fact that I feel like if you put the ice in too early, like I mean, you, you might put the sugar cube on top of it or you have your cube already and it it's crushed by the bigger cube yeah. on the inside you know so one of one of the um kind of uh nice parts of this drink and like a an experiential part of the drink is actually leaving a little bit of the sugar at the bottom because it gives your last sip like yeah. really sweet and that kind of clears your palate for your next drink. one of the one of the things that about the sazerac in particular and you know with if you do other drinks with the uh, sugar cubes like an old-fashioned for example like that part of the sugar being left at the end was something that originally i was like oh did i like do this wrong or something no, not all the sugar absolved that's intense but that's intense. that's the way it's supposed to be yeah that was on purpose that's kind of cool actually um so what, all we need to do at this point is get a big ice cube in here and this oh, is yeah. a very important drink to have a big ice cube oh yeah do not we want need the big ones so let's I'll grab, go, I'll go grab a couple of big cubes for yep. us yeah so we're gonna put this under the into the glass again you could have added the ice cube before you added everything but i think it's harder to get the sugar to incorporate appropriately when the ice is in there There's so one thank you i hope this yeah. fits Oh, it'll fit definitely. I think I think that glass is big enough yeah. for him. So just kind of put it on the side and be a little gentle with it. Very good. Yeah. Look how gorgeous that looks yeah. in there. Look at that. Gorgeous looking. Awesome. And then give me one more bar spoon. Yeah. Wherever it is. Let's see. We got yeah. one more switch bar spoon again. There we go. I'm slowly Here. but we can surely both, filling we can up the. We can do this at the same time. There we go. So don't be super aggressive. We're just gonna give this like maybe ten or eleven turns. Just to get it a little chilled, because again, we don't want to screw up our absinthe wash. That's true, yeah. Because if, if we usually, I feel like when you're doing like a stir and stuff, you want to like kind more. of basically let the glass do the stuff for you. You're not, at least according to technique, you're really not supposed to be turning the spoon itself. Yep. You're supposed to let the curvature of the glass do that for you. But in this case, if you're using the glass curvature, you're kind of scraping all the absinthe off the walls. Exactly. It might just be those peelers. I was trying to do some peeling on some of the blood oranges left over from last week. It's a little, and dull. It's a little it's, dull. It's a dull. It's a dull one. All right. Better one. Then we're just going to finish all the little bit of lemon peel here. A so squid, spray, spray. Wipe the rim again. I always do that with any time I add any sort of citrus. Mm -hmm. And that is our Sazerac. 
You can also garnish this with a maraschino cherry if you want to. I, I see people do that all the time. Ooh, do you want that? No, not not for this one. I think it'll be all right. I think so, I think this is complex enough. So the first thing I want you to do when you bring this up to your nose, you're gonna smell the absinthe that we rinse this in. You smell it? Yes. Oh my goodness. It's that it's that lemon combining with the absinthe. Oh my god, it's so good. Mmm. <laughs> That's such a good wow. cocktail. Oh my god. You know what's it's so the burn, because I think I probably sipped it incorrectly for the for the rye whiskey in there, but like inside of that burn, whereas usually it would be like this tasteless, this very Ex like painful experience there was like a, almost a flavor in that heat that i was experiencing which i have not had in another cocktail before and i think it's probably if i had to guess probably the absinthe and the rittenhouse rye there in particular the burn from the rye but the flavor from the absinthe i guess but also like there's another component there that i can't quite pick out and i don't have pichon's bitters very often so i wonder if that's mm -hmm. that's that flavor yeah, sneaking and, in there and this is not a this is not supposed to be like a really easy sipping cocktail. Like this no. is this is supposed to be strong. This is um, this is this is definitely like oh you know what there's another oh now I'm tasting the absinthe. Oh now now I'm really getting it. See? Wow that plays so well with the rye. Yeah that's all it's because rye is kind of spicy. And yeah. So the the spicy flavor with mm -hmm. the absinthe. It's definitely amazing. the rye is very very prevalent here, but it's prevalent and it's not it's not distracting. Mm. Man that's so good. Oh my god. I like that. And there's even like a there's a there is a tinge. Of sweetness, I wouldn't say it's super duper noticeable, but if you're trying to find like like a component of this that isn't as in your face, there is a bit of that sugar dissolved in there. Yeah, and usually, usually um, they will serve this to you in a restaurant with a little um, with a little uh, thing to stir with to mm -hmm. try to help incorporate the sugar more mm -hmm. if you need it sweeter. I'm wondering. I yeah, actually, I actually, there's a there's a sizable amount of sugar still at the bottom there i think actually i might need a little bit more of the sugar in there because it's it's not enough of it for it to be totally noticeable but let me let me stir mine yeah, up and you can more. you can do a uh you can do a little bit of your syrup too if you need to add a little bit more that's true that's but true. everybody like i said everybody kind of has their own liking i actually really like them that strong like that but not everybody likes that so I'm starting to see the ice cube whittling down from the liquid it's in oh yeah hmm so that's much much more pleasant now now that you've started a little bit more yeah yeah i'm actually kind of getting a little bit of the for lack for, for lack of a better way to describe it it's almost like i'm tasting a bit of the dilution there from the ice cube yeah and it's like it's like i don't it's almost it's like the strength of everything else but it's a little bit toned down and maybe that's just like me kind of peeking through like the other flavors that are in there you can that's definitely cool. get like it, this is a pretty simple cocktail right it's not that many ingredients mm -hmm. but the flavors are very distinct and like they're on purpose right so like the pay chowds is just this like super like you get the fruitiness of it but also yeah. just the bitter kick mm -hmm. the the bonded rye gives it the proof the bitter kind of floats on top of that proofy spicy yeah. rye when you take a when you smell the drink as you smell in you smell the licorice taste mm. but then you get fruity yeah, and, yeah, and 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 the rye, and, and even that that expressed lemon peel around the on the edge too. It's not even it's, it's it blends well with the the licorice notes of the absinthe yeah. as well. Oh shoot, hold on. The Anna must have turned the lights off and gone to bed, and sometimes they'll turn off the lights up here. It's not a power outage. The stream is still going, and allow me a moment to turn the lights back on. Wow, <laughs> this is the second time that's happened. It spooked <laughs> me both times. Spooked. Stream's still going though. We're good. <laughs> Did anyone notice I changed my shirt while the light was off? No. What color was the shirt before? <laughs> no, but that's that's good. It's so so. Is this? I, I guess I'll ask you. Is this in the family of cocktails you like? I think this is a little more honestly. It's a little more spirit forward than I think I would usually go for. Mm -hmm. This is very very. I, I think what I what I'm probably getting distracted by is something like this feels a lot more akin to I'm sipping the whiskey neat or a little like a couple of rocks in there, and I really should be at least for my palate probably be drinking this slower and with a lot more patience associated with it i would say too another thing that i've kind of explored a bit when i use like ice and drinks to too excuse me getting the hiccups is that as the ice melts the f other flavor components of the drink begin to evolve over time and being that like i guess was it intentional that we left the ice cube in here to dilute it 
over time. Oh yes, absolutely. Because I yeah, think cause that's it, like it, a, it changes. It, it changes the flavor, which is something. That's why we understirred it initially. Yeah, like, yeah. You do the same thing for old fashions. You understir an old fashioned to start with, so you can taste. The, yeah. Uh, the whiskey at its like warmer qualities, mm -hmm. and then as that as it dilutes, you get different. And flavors. it gets colder. It kind and, of changes yeah, a little and, around. And, and the drink changes in the glass. And I guess you know, as the ice cube melts, there's more water in the drink. There's more space for that sugar to dissolve, and it kind of incorporates it more. It almost kind of incorporates it more for you without you needing mm. to do any extra work. All you need to do is sip take your time and, it's, and enjoy i just i love the the hit of absinthe smell that you get from this drink it's so good there is a piece of this like i don't i don't know what it is um because i've had bubble gummy tasting cocktails before i remember when we were doing the manhattans the antica formula vermouth can be a little bit bubble gummy to me but there is a bubble gummy component to this and if i try to think logically the common point was the Rittenhouse where i am there and i don't want to say that's the point it might just also be like whatever i think it's the bit i think it's the, the, bitters. the, the bitters which is really it's really really interesting yeah, it's a it's a good drink. All right. So, any other thoughts on the Sazerac? This is definitely an acquired taste. This it is. It is definitely an acquired taste. I would say compared to when I tried it a long time ago at I think it was the it might be called the Oyster House here in Philadelphia. I went there for a fraternity event. We were having an e board meeting, trying to decide like budgeting or something like that. It was the most pretentious I'd felt in a while. We had an entire <laughs> like three or four plates of just like straight up oysters, and I love seafood, so I was totally into it. But I got there, and the first thing I did as I waited for everybody else is I ordered the Sazerac, feeling like I was on my high horse and being like, wow. I fucking hate this. But this is... You like this better than that? I like it better than that, probably because there's been a lot more time in between, but also because, like, I would mix better, honestly. Do you feel, I don't even know what was in it. Do you feel like it tastes the same as that other one does? Or no. Is it better? Is def it it's it's definitely better. better. Yeah. I think... I, I, I don't know what kind of spirits they were in. They were using then. Like, I don't know if they actually did use, like, a Rittenhouse Bond, Bottled and Bond rye or whatever yeah. they were using there. But, like, I think absinthe, I can now identify. Pichot's bitters are coming out of a left field for me. That's, like, that's a component of this drink that is kind of making me a little more... It, it's surprising me because I'm like, wow, this is a flavor that I'm not super familiar with yet. And honestly, this has been... This has been in, in my collection for so long now, and I yeah. just didn't really know how to use it. And I think I've honestly been kind of scared of the Sazerac. I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not ready to touch that yet. But it's honestly, it's... And if if a high proof cocktail is your thing, this is rather approachable. Oh yeah, and it's and it's it's uh, very complex. Yeah, which I, I mean, if you can if you can sip whiskey neats, you can do a sazerac and yeah. you'd appreciate it. Yeah, and I um I also think that um there's a lot of recipes for sazeracs. Like there's not a one mm. like exact recipe for it. Yeah, we kind of follow the one that's in the book. Mm -hmm. um, in this book, which is an older recipe, but there's also newer yeah. versions of it. So yeah, I, I think if I had if I had to do this again a little bit differently, little I'd probably a little bit sweeter there, maybe a different type of sugar entirely, and probably split the base between the the Pichard's bitters and the Angostura because I really and maybe that's just because there's a piece of me that is more familiar with Angostura, yeah. so I want to have a, it in there. You can put a, a shot of Angostura in there now just to see how it I tastes. Think, I think um, you know what? Just a, it's. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to taste to try it. I kind of, I kind of want to. Yeah, I kind of want to try it. I'll try it. What I'll try it with you thing? too. It's right there. Let's go for it. That's what. That's what this whole process is for. But don't put it on the ice. It'll freeze if you get the ice. Ooh. Okay. So, you so gotta, kinda wanna, kinda kinda go on the tip side. it a little bit and that works. A little, bit of that. a little bit of that. A little like dash and a half almost. Hmm. I definitely changed it. Smell the air. Let me think of store now. Yeah, well, that completely changed it for me. So it's a lot more cinnamony now. Yeah, and like the, the it's the it's herbal, almost the it's, aspect it's almost it. like the cinnamony notes of the Angostura is almost substantiating the spiciness from the rye. I think just maybe maybe I've been in so indoctrinated in the Angostura bitters with the rye whiskey that it's 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 almost it's it's almost kind of freaky to go with something else like yeah. the Shug, which is kind of I mean again another like kind of classic bitter there, but fundamentally a different type too. Yeah. It's very, cool. It's very, good to, good very, to explain the palate. Yeah, good, interesting discussion. In the broad scheme of uh, whiskey cocktails, Sazerac's are not my favorite, to be totally honest. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like Old Fashioned's Manhattan's way more. Yeah. Um, no, like, I, way, I way that. more. Um, I think, I've, as I've been, I've been trying to make more Manhattan's and uh, whatnot as well for myself, yeah. mostly to try to, like, pick out more on the, the vermouth, like, ever since we had the, the, the Manhattan, the Manhattan history on the 24-hour stream, I, like, was like, man, I need to really figure out how this vermouth stuff is working, and actually, well, specifically for, for the next cocktail that we'll be, do, we'll be doing, I bought a fresh bottle of dry vermouth because I wanted to see it that same, like, fresh out the cask was going yeah. to be, like, hit the dry vermouth the same way that it does the Well, and you need, 
you need fresh bottles of vermouth to make it good. Did. And when you had my Manhattan, mm -hmm. you were like, holy crap, this is another it's, it's, level. It's life changing. I saw, I saw <laughs> somebody else doing a stream the other day, and I saw them, and like, like, like the, no harm, no foul, but I saw them pull out the big, like, 750 milliliter bottle of Formula Antica, and I was like, I don't think you've used all that. I don't think you used it much that often of that, and I bet it's been in the fridge for a little while. And I'm I'm also guilty of that, but there's a piece of understanding there now after really having yeah. experienced it because of you bringing the knowledge here that like it's like a you. I mean, if you don't know that you're missing it, ignorance yeah, is bliss. And, and but if you do know you're missing it, you're like, I feel bad that the vermouth is still in my fridge. You're like, man, I gotta be making more Manhattans to make the good use out of well, this. For, for those of you that uh, did not get to watch that part of the 24 hour stream, the gist of that conversation was that with vermouth, uh, which we're gonna be using in our final cocktail of the night, the Gibson, um, you need to buy fresh bottles almost like as often as you can because uh, vermouth is a wine. And just like your bottle of red wine that you buy, you have with dinner at night, if you leave it, uh, open for like a week mm -hmm. the flavor like goes downhill really quick it, oh, yeah. it, it uh it oxidizes it gets more vinegary tasting the the, the reason most people don't like vermouth cocktails so i'm talking about like martinis for dry vermouth um for red vermouth would be like manhattans or yeah. negronis or things in that nature most people don't like those because they're using the shitty bottle of martini and rossi that they've had in their liquor cabinet for 15 years i am personally guilty of that exact statement yeah. although i 15 <laughs> years is would be illegal at this point yes but you know what i mean yeah and so on the stream uh cam had a bottle of carpano antica which is the best the best vermouth Fre freshly popped freshly popped but we also had an older bottle of yeah. it too so and cam compared the taste with the two and it was yeah. like night so cam and day. so cam cam had an old bottle of carpano antica we tasted it i said this does not taste as good as it usually does let's open the new bottle we opened the new bottle tasted it, and cam's eyes like just i i shit you not ever <laughs> since that stream I, I have like I've been putting more thought into like like the quality of the ingredients and stuff. And there is a there is a piece of my mentality when I'm like, okay, well we need to get more we need to get particular like ingredients for a stream. It's like there is a certain level of effort that I feel like needs to be put into this. Yeah. Or else like we're just like we're saying like, like it's like having a Manhattan with the with the shitty vermouth and being like, yeah, I guess the Manhattan's not really all it's cracked up to be. But your basis was off. So of course you're gonna have something that's not tasting yeah, the same. Well and it makes such a big difference with the type of spirits you may use too, right? Mm. So like if you use uh, like Jack Daniels or something to make a Manhattan with, it's not going to be good. Mm -hmm. But if you use Rittenhouse Bonded yeah. and you use Carpano and Tika yeah. together, Every, like, holy crap, that is the, a good combo. The beauty, the beauty of various different types of spirits is that they all kind of have their place. And it's a really, really complex question. And to be honest, coming from like, we're both, we're both engineers and that kind of, that, that premise of there is a complex problem to be solved and this sort of question of optimization is a very, very ambiguous one is something that I personally vibe with. And I'm sure you've experienced as well throughout your career too. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the fact that we can vibe with this also drinking cocktails too, is yeah. just like, oh man, <laughs> it's a perfect synergy. All right, let's finish off the night with a martini, shall we? I love that idea. So we're gonna talk about martinis. Uh, there's a very big chapter in the imbibe book um, about martinis and kind of the history of the martini. Lots of different, uh, backgrounds of, of where the drink came from it's kind of generally accepted that many people came up with it uh concurrently it's not like there was a necessarily single individual uh that came up with it however the gibson variant does have a specific story mm -hmm. associated Actually, with that it. was really interesting to read i didn't realize that yeah and i'm gonna i i was blanking on the name i pulled it up a minute ago some I'm, somebody gives it dave gibson there might have been an angela gibson it was back in 1908 and it was from where did it go? Yeah, Charles Dana Gibson was behind the Gibson girl drawings from the 1890s to the 1920s. And he was the one that basically coined the idea of doing a Gibson martini. Now, interestingly, the most fascinating part in the book that I thought about the Gibson story, mm -hmm. um, if for anybody that, that has never had a current day Gibson, and this is like one of my favorite cocktails, I love Gibson's. I don't. I don't drink almost any other martinis except for Gibson's. And and I'll say too, like when I when I did cover a very 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 new uh, perspective of the Gibson that was there in a casino cocktail recipe uh, episode because it was just martinis and stuff. Um, somebody popped on and was saying specifically like the Gibson martini is like the go to. There's a lot that goes into it, and specifically the cocktail onion. Yeah. And the brine that you use for it is just like it adds a whole another angle yeah. to the drink that is 
Oh, just so please keep so, going. So a Gibson martini is a gin martini, which is a very uh, uncommon thing nowadays. Actually, like most yeah. most people get vodka no, martinis like, nowadays. I was I was legitimately having a conversation with someone the other day, and they were like, "Uh, what's in a martini?" I was like, "Well, a martini. I mean, if you ask me, like it's you know, it's get it's got gin. It's a it's a gin drink, gin and vermouth." And they're like, "But more contemporarily, it's a term for just a popular." cocktail yeah. and usually it's got vodka in it and it's it's a it, it a, um excuse me it takes on the flavor of whatever the theme of the martini was apple teeny espresso martini yeah apple, yada, yada, apple yada, yada, made, made famous by the show scrubs exactly apple teeny. love apple teenies <laughs> um i watched but, the entirety of scrubs so oh show. yeah scrubs is a great show it's a great show so martinis traditionally were gin specifically London dry gin, although Plymouth gin also was very popular. Again, that was kind of the more common gin back in the day. It's hard to find nowadays. The Holland gin, the you old- You said the Plymouth gin was actually more prevalent? Back in the day, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. That's, that, that's why all these recipes in this book call for Plymouth uh, gin. That makes more sense. Because Plym- that was just like the style of gin back then that didn't exist until like just maybe 10 years ago. Because mm-hmm. um, it, it just went out, of, was not popular for a while. Okay, it's quarter- so it's, it's, it was, it's gin, vermo- dry vermouth, um, and then whatever garnish you add to it. And traditionally, so this is actually kind of wild, and mm-hmm. there's a brief tangent I'm going to go on, but not even just with the Gibson, but with martinis in general, the ratio of the spirit to the vermouth has mm-hmm. long been debated for like since the drink was invented. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. back in the day when the martinis first came around around the early 1900s, where it's like 1908, 1910, like somewhere around there, um, the traditional uh ratio for gin to vermouth was one to one so it's equal parts Mm -hmm. gin and vermouth um as the years went on that ratio shrunk more and more so you went from a one to one ratio which was you know so you do basically if you're doing a two ounce or uh Mm -hmm. if you're doing a three you know a normal cocktail you would do like an ounce and a half of gin and an ounce and a half of vermouth. Yeah. Right? And that gives you like a three ounce cocktail. It becomes that, more, it became more drier dilutes, over time yeah, with di- more on the spirit dilutes, itself. Dilutes up to about four ounces, which is yeah. like about a standard cocktail size, yeah. right? So uh, it was about 50 50. Then they started moving to be 60 40, right? I think the 60 40 ratio talk, is in, in they, this book. They're yeah. talking about 60 40. My preferred way to have a gin martini is two to one gin to vermouth. So mm-hmm. two ounces of gin, one ounce of vermouth. I feel like I vibe with that. That is, that is my favorite way to do it. Most, the contemporary way to make a martini nowadays is to have like a, a sliver of vermouth in the drink, Tiny like a splash of vermouth. Cause for some reason, like people don't like the vermouth taste. And I, I, it goes back to my comments about like, I think people have had like shitty the, vermouth their whole life. Well, if you think about it, right? Like if you're making only a certain amount of martinis and you're putting a little bit of vermouth in there and you get the same size bottle every single time, if people order eight, let's say a constant amount of martinis and you're putting a little bit in every time, it, that bottle will last longer, which goes against the taste of the drink, yeah. which is unfortunate. Right. So nowadays you'll see most recipes only calling for like a quarter ounce mm-hmm. of vermouth or a half ounce. Yeah. Uh, like, or a spl- or literal, it will say a splash. Yeah. Vermouth, which and is- I'm actually, I'm actually curious. Like keep, keep on going there. I'm going to see what ratio I used during that one stream. Yeah. I'm curious what, what it was that I had. I think it might've been a two- I, look, it, look it up. Yeah, I remember. The other, the other interesting uh, discussion with martinis nowadays is the use of gin versus vodka. So mm-hmm. most contemporary martinis that you'll get at a restaurant or like at a fancy bar where they yeah. have like the really cool looking martinis that have like colors and shit in them, um, they usually will make them with vodka nowadays. Yeah, um, yeah. And so it basically the gin, the gin component, I guess, like. People aren't liking the gin, or yeah, it's just well, it's conflicting think, with the other. I think gin gin has gone in and out of style. You know, I think mm. vodka broadly has been in style more for the last 25, 30 years yeah. compared to gin, especially once women like women drink a lot more uh, martinis than men generally. Oh like, yeah, it, it yeah. Show, and I guess the vodka spirits are a little more neutral. They take on more yeah. like the flavor of like the the more fruitier components the, the in there problem, and the, everything else. The problem I have with vodka martinis, and th- this is also a reason why I think people mm-hmm. don't like martinis. Very much. You're saying because. vodka martini in the in the sense of vodka and dry vermouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah, it's like vodka and like a splash of vermouth. Yeah, it's like you're basically just drinking a cold glass of vodka. Uh, yep. Yeah, and most people don't like that. Yeah, and I mean to be fair, if you're putting a little bit of a spl- like a little bit of dry vermouth in there, like if the you know if the dry vermouth is not really good, yeah. it's almost like you put a little bit of like it's like having like stagnant tap water. It's like you're like this is off, but like 
Yeah. Why? So, so what and, I would like to do with you tonight, Cam, yeah. I, I would like to make two martinis. Ooh. I want to make it the ratio they have in the book mm -hmm. so you can taste it. I'd love to. And yeah. then I want to make my two to one ra ratio. Oh, I'm down with that. <clears throat> and, I'll, and I'll say, the I looked up the recipe that I used last night. It was two and a half ounces to a half an ounce yeah. gin to dry vermouth. <laughs> it's essentially just a splash of it. Yeah. And I remember when I had that, I was like, oh, this is good. This is a good martini. However, yeah, so you're gonna I, see, want, I want there to be blood out of the you're water. Gonna, you're going to see the differences here. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Everything here has been cleaned, so we can put oh, good. Put okay. things here. Yeah. So um, one other thing, let's talk about the Gibson specifically. Yeah. Um, traditionally, a Gibson uh, is garnished with a uh, pickled onion. Okay, so Ooh. let's pull up the, the camera. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The boom arm's a little bit weird. Feel free to be completely aggressive with that thing. Okay, so uh, these are some Mits cocktail Mits onions. Mitsada. So these these work fine. These these work fine for for Gibsons. I um, am a very 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 big fan of Jeffrey Morgenthaler's recipe for cocktail onions. Mm -hmm. You can find it on his website. Um, I have. It's also in his book, The Bar Book. If anybody has that book. That, that recipe is phenomenal. They make the best cocktail onions you've had in your life. Um, so they're, and, they're and fantastic. And I mean, more recently, if I can make it, if I can make it fresh, I'll yeah. do that. I mean, Eric was telling me before the stream that the cocktail onions that he made for himself, you used for like, what, a year or so after the oh, fact? Oh, at least, like, yeah. He just kept on using it because it's so damn well, good. And they're, and they're pickled, so they last, they last basically forever as long as you keep them refrigerated. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the traditional uh, garnish of a Gibson. Uh, other martinis are so a traditional martini usually is garnished with a lemon twist. Mm. Um, I actually like my favorite martini aside from Gibson's are yeah. with orange twists. Ooh. I actually think martinis with orange twists are better than with lemon twists. Interesting. Um, but again, everybody has their own kind of preference, and I, I like gin martinis too. So like gin martini with an orange twist is my mm. favorite way to. Do I think it. there's a there's a piece of me I love the way a lemon a lemon twist smells just because I think like lemon verbena is like this hand soap. Oh yeah, In one of my brother's house. Yeah, that's good like, stuff. It's good smell. It's very familiar. All right, so first we're gonna do the one-to-one -one ratio that they call for in the book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Will we need another stirring glass? Or we, yeah. wanna, we can probably use the reuse we, the same one because it's the same we, recipe. We, we can reuse okay, it. That's, that's fine. what we'll do. Okay. So for the gin, uh, let's pick a dry gin, a London dry so gin. So I got, I believe, when I was looking at the book, it called for a substantially chilled. So that's the only reason I had this sitting gotcha. in the freezer. I know. I, I was like, I was like, what are you doing? I will put that in there. <laughs> take out the vermouth, which has also been. Hasn't been in here for very long. Good. I promise you that. Ooh, nice. Noli Prat. Noli Prat. I think that's, that's what they were recommending yeah, here no, in particular. Yeah, yeah Noli Prat. And I need a new dry vermouth. Noli Prat's good stuff. Ooh, fresh. Uh-oh. You know what this means. You gotta try another, it. Another you gotta taste try it. <laughs> I was sitting there like, I get to crack this open. Yeah. Like, oh my God. So, this is an experience. If you guys have never had an experience of drinking vermouth straight from a freshly opened bottle, you need to. Because it is, it's an experience. It's it's different. I remember when I, my first bottle of vermouth, it was me and another close friend of mine at the time downstairs. Oh, it's so good. Mmm. <laughs> wow. Okay. Isn't that great? First, nice first thing I got, it's almost, almost it, it almost struck me like ginger ale. Yeah. Like a botanical ginger like ale? A, like oh my a, God. Less than the ginger. It almost, More on the ale. It almost has like the champagne yeah. taste to it. Okay, so when I first cracked, when I cracked up my first bottle of sweet vermouth, I, I was with another friend of mine at the time, and I took a little sip of it, and I was like, this is vinegary. And this was after I opened up, it was a bottle of Martini and Rossi, it was the red stuff. And now I looked at this, oh my god, it's, it's good. Yeah, and the aftertaste is like, you still get the white wine flavors. Yeah. But then you also get like a lot more of like an herbaceous type of flavor to it as well. And that's, that's the... That's the way that they force. This is I, I'm getting. It's it's almost like this is gonna make a good martini. <laughs> it's almost like oil, like oil and vinegar. It's almost like ginger ale. It's almost like like all of that, like the quintessentialness of that together, all with a little bit, yeah. all with the white wine component to it. It's good. It's really wow. Good. It's really good. It's, it's really really. I didn't pay my, that much for that bottle either. Yeah, no, no one Pratt's a good brand. Honestly, there was, a, like, there was another brand they were selling. It was, it was, I think seven dollars for I think a whole seven fifty. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember what so brand it was. I'm, I'm surprised. I'm gonna be honest. I don't mind Martini and Rossi, um, dry vermouth. I don't like their sweet vermouth very much. Mm -hmm. like the red vermouth. The, yeah, the sweet vermouth. Like when I it was my it was my first one, and I was kind of taken aback by it, like, oh, is this what vermouth is supposed to taste like? And then Carpano and Tico but, walked into my life. Yeah, exactly. Fresh. But and I was like, uh, okay. The the Martin and Rossi uh, dry vermouth's not that bad actually. Yeah. Um, it's but it's it's one of those things where just everybody's had their bottle for 
Yeah. Years. And to be fair, the, the two bottles of dry and sweet vermouth that I've had for the longest are Martini and Rossi. It's just, it's just what I had available. Yeah. All right. So, so this is the half ratio, so right? This is the one half, one. So this is the half ratio. This is what they call for in the cocktail book. Mm -hmm. um, or the old version. Do you have an ice I can use? Yeah, absolutely. Big old cube? Yeah. How are we doing on ice? How are we doing fine? We I got, got plenty of ice. We got more? Okay. Oh, yeah. Very good, very good. Try to keep, I don't, I think I got these, I, got, I think I got these ones a while ago. Here, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, you know, crack it. yeah, go for it. Crack this bad boy. If there's any other questions in chat about uh, martinis, let us know, We or vermouth, because I, I love, I, I have some some hot takes on vermouth. That yeah, and also curious I too, give. for more of the cocktail professionals out there too, those who are like the actual bartenders, those on or across the seas as well, if you have any more thoughts on these as well. Personal, like favorite ratios as well. Um, other garnishes and riffs on it as well. I'm also very, very curious about. So, um, martinis should be like pretty ice cold. Mm. Um, this is one one drink you want yeah. to serve to be very cold. Ordered a martini at one of the diners close to my parents' house one time. It was a very, very warm martini, and I was I was okay with it. I liked it. However, if it was more chilled, I'd be I, I feel like I'd probably be a little more into it. Yeah, it's it's a bad drink when it's not cold. Mm. Okay, and we do have martini glasses down here, I believe. Oh, we do. We have, I, we have one small martini glass. Can you, crack, are... can you crack those cocktail onions? Absolutely, yeah. Where are we? Over here? Yeah, there's one small martini glass and one large one. Okay. Um, martini glasses were hard to come by, at least. We will make do with what we have. It's okay. Oh my god, I love the smell of those onions. Gotta grab some toothpicks, or... Yeah. Actually, we got the one... We got the one boot spoon over here that's got the trident oh, to it. Perfect. I if we this is a, have one of those. Yeah, this is actually a very good use for this. It's perfect. So, um, one trick with these is you don't want the brine. Hmm. So it's well, not. Well, I feel like there's enough of the brine that kind of sticks to the onion itself. Right, and the onion already is pretty powerful. Oh yeah. Like you don't need more. Mm hmm. Um. So, in that sense, it seems that there is like a bit of an art to the Gibson as well in terms of how you're serving it. Yeah, and it's this is one of those cocktails that where did my julep strainer go? Um, I think I cleaned it off. Where did I put it though? We have to use oh, the right. I did, I made such a fuss about yep. using Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, I got I have, to. I have to use it. Um there is there's a lot of uh it's it's very few ingredients, so you need to make sure that few ingredients are very good. Mm -hmm. This tulip shit is just slightly too small for this cup. Yeah, I feel like glass. I mean it do you have stirring glasses too, right? Like are they bigger than this or it's smaller? Smaller. That's what I think that's what I meant to say. I think I think it's Yeah, I feel like these are rather large stirring glasses, and every time I've used the julep strainer, I'm like, this is it was a lot. Yeah. Okay. So this is the 50-50. And then we're gonna we're gonna do the the way I like it as well. Mm -hmm. Um and I also and remind you know, remind me what that ratio was again? Two to one. Two to one is what I like. One. Cheers, good sir. Gibson, Martini. It's actually not bad. Eh. It's pretty good. I think the it's nice. Nothing nothing in there is particularly overpowering. Yeah, give it a little swirl to get the onion flavor in there. Yeah, I was gonna say like, I could definitely use more of the onion flavor. Mm. Well, it's the the whole point of it. It's it's supposed to be one of those things that evolves in the drink. It's not yeah. supposed to be forward onion right away. That's a good point. That's a good point. It's actually not bad. Yeah, it's not, it's not too bad at all. It's the first time I've had the Noily Pratt Dry Vermouth and I guess just any gin in general, the botanist in this particular case yeah. here together, and it's it's nice. There's actually. Like the more ginger ale notes that I get, I don't know why I keep coming up with ginger ale, but it's not some of the ginger, more on the ale, I guess if I had to describe that. It's like, there's a sweetness to it that I actually do quite appreciate a little bit. It's more, I think this is the most appreciable, uh, approachable martini that I've had. Oh yeah, for Whether sure. that's the ratio or the particular ingredients that are being used, I most, think it's the ingredients. Because most, most martinis are like very overpowering, like gross, mm -hmm. generally. When you have them, I agree with that. Okay, so for this one that we're gonna well, do now, I'm getting some of the onion notes in there, and that's yeah. you see what I mean. That's a it's, nice. It's, it's a drink that like evolves over time. The salt is in. It's enhancing the quality of things. So that's a pretty honestly. I've never I've never done the 50 50 before. That's actually yeah. not bad. That's not bad that's, at all. Very I, approachable. I think you will like this version better though. Mm -hmm. So this is gonna be one ounce of the vermouth. The vermouth. Two ounces of the gin. Two ounces of gin. Excellent. So Excellent. this drink's a little boozier. So. Just for reference, I did one and a half of each in mm. that other drink. Yeah. You need another piece of ice in there? I will need another piece yeah, of ice. Yeah, let me go grab that for you. Two ounces of gin. I probably will stir this one a little longer. I think it need to be a bit colder. See, I actually wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have chilled the uh, gin at least because mm -hmm. it doesn't dilute as quick. 
if it the gin chill, it's chill. yeah that's a good point and then you don't get the dilution yeah i think i think i saw i saw the thing in there and i was like yeah i know it's underprepared but you know. I, it, it said that it's okay yeah. it's, it's not a huge deal i wonder i guess the motivation for chilling the spirits as well is that kind of like a for the times thing i wonder it, it could be yeah i wonder if like I mean, if you had a high enough alcohol content, you wouldn't need to chill it or preserve it in some way. So I wonder if oh, this was and for then, the preservation or for the flavor. The other thing I put, I forgot about this. In my, I'm going to do the orange version next. Ooh, just because okay. You, yeah. I put a couple dashes of orange bitters That's in a too. Good idea. It's a nice angle to it. This will be the best martini you've ever had. I promise. This is like my favorite. This is my absolute favorite way to have a what martini. What a way to clinch things off, man. Yeah. It's a good <laughs> night. You should start a night with a martini. You probably shouldn't end it with one, but... But we're doing Here chronological we order this time, so we, right. had to, we had to go with it. Here we are. A little more stir on this. I want this, like, ice cold. It's got to have a nice... And then can nice you can stuff. you give me a nice big uh, orange peel? Oh, yeah, totally. I think, let's see. I'm hoping that one of my oranges that I got over here is going gonna, is gonna to come up to the task. Certainly hope so. Eh, we'll make it work. All right, so this is a very... We'll end with these. These are nice. These are like punch, these are like punch glasses. Which ones? These guys. Those ones? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah those are the only glasses that I would consider to be coupe glasses. This is a good peel. You need more? Yeah, of that? that'll work. Perfect. 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 All right. So this is not a Gibson because it doesn't have the onion in there. That's true. You definitely could have done this with the onion. Uh, just don't put the orange bitters in. Mm -hmm. But we got a comment from Imichao Ginza, a restaurant down near Lycos and Jasper, had a lychee martini that, if they recall, was gin forward. If you like sweet. Highly recommend. Ooh. Yeah. Do you ever have anything with lychee in it? I've had a few things with lychee. It's, it's very tasty. Yeah. I think uh, one of the other cocktail streamers out there was doing, I think, a lychee, lychee daiquiri the other day. Uh, and it was oof, very, very good stuff, it seemed. He was actually taking the lychee. Now, I don't know where he got them. Might be like like an H Mart or something. Yeah. Um, but he, I was actually like popping them out, popping the seeds out and putting them in the blender and stuff. And it was good. Daiquiris being more, I think, lime juice and rum, mm. I believe. Can't okay. quite recall. So take a sip of that. That is one of the best martinis you will have. This is, all right, it was the two, so, two, two to, to one. one ratio, gin to dry vermouth, and we had some orange bitters in there and an orange twist. Yeah. Mm. Oh, already it smells awesome. And that's like, that's, it's a blood orange that I peeled over there, and that's got a very nice smell to it. Yeah. Oh my God, it's so good. Okay. I'm confused. The dry vermouth and the orange bitters are almost tasting like, and I, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's like not candy, like sweet candy, candy like a particular flavor of a type of candy. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't, I can't think of the so word for it. I think uh, apricot is actually a flavor. Yeah, that it's yes. Close oh to. my god! As yeah. soon as you said that, yes. Yeah, apricots coming yeah. close to. Isn't wow! That, is, isn't that amazing how good that is? It's wild, and there is a little bit of a sweetness there that I just I didn't see coming. Yeah, and you can order this in a restaurant. You can ask for a gin martini with an orange twist, and they'll they'll make this. They'll make this, and most bartenders will put the orange bitters in it. Wow, and it's I I think like so this is actually a very very classic way to make a martini. This is how they did them back in like the twenties. Dude, even just taking a small small sip, just like swallowing it and letting the air mm. do the job for you it's such a nice aftertaste yeah very pleasant and compare compare it to the the gibson one so mm -hmm. the, the the gibson one is going to be very oniony still but um i want you to think about the balance of the vermouth to the gin mm -hmm. like try to ignore the try to ignore the i know the onion is strong but like try to ignore the onion a little bit and think about the balance of the alcohols so that doesn't yeah. feel, that's there's not too as, much, it's there's not too as much, proofy. I'd even say it's too, it's too sweet. Yes. Because of the, the, the um, sorry, the, the vermouth, vermouth in there. The vermouth. Well, it's, it's not sweet vermouth, but vermouth is still yeah, sweet Yeah, 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 but the, 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 the vermouth has like a sweetness to it. It's almost too much mm. for this that's particular still, ratio. That's still a pretty good cocktail to be yeah. honest. And I love this like, more salty component coming from the onion. Yeah. We had a quick comment from Dom saying, I really enjoy how the wood looks on that table. I actually adjusted my camera angle. We can actually see the top of the bar now. I'm glad that somebody's taking notice of it. Yeah, that actually is a, a good point. We the, didn't the, see that before. The original idea was if I could tilt the camera down a little bit and zoom in on the top of the cocktail glass, then we'd get a better view of the cocktails yeah. and stuff. However, this angle was a new development. So this is... Those are Gibson. Wee -oo, spend, wee -oo, wee -oo. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. <laughs> but even still. Now, Cam, one other thing we can do, if you want me to, is I can make you a two to one Gibson. 
to two see. to one Gibson to see if it's better. Yeah, if you'd like. Why not? Let's do it. Why not? Let's go for so, it. We have. I mean, I mean, we're gonna have to gonna have to reuse these glasses and stuff. Can't have a martini and not got, a martini glass. We got, we, we, to, we got one more. Actually, we actually, got one yeah. more set of glasses. I was gonna say we do have the other two. I'm calling them the coupe glasses. I don't know if they're technically coupe glasses. Or not. That's, a, that's a technicality. It's the, end, it's the end of the stream. We're almost there. It's so true. let's 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 go out with a bang. For, so we're making those of you who don't know the behind the scenes stuff. Literally, the 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 most time that stream takes is planning the recipes. And then cleaning up after the recipes. The whole like stream process itself, although we're almost at the three hour mark, like there's more time preparing and cleaning up than anything else. And that's mostly because the dishwasher has like an hour and a half cycle. So it's like the only cycle it has too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, I think there's four there's, there's there's I think four modes to it. There's like a full wash, simple wash. I don't know if the others do. One it's, it's irrelevant. One other thing I will reiterate while I'm making this last one here. Oh yes. Yeah. Like, can you tell just the quality of the ingredients, like how important that is with this drink? Yeah. Cause like, this is good gin and this is pretty like, good vermouth. This is not the first martini I've had. And even even going back to the Sazerac, not the first Sazerac I've had. And throughout this entire thing so far, the, excuse me, get a bit of the hiccups there. Especially when it comes to these, these, I call them classic drinks because that's just chronologically speaking, they are drinks of the classic time. But these more shorter drinks, what you wind up doing is you have less of the mixer to kind of lean on. Like if there's something sweet there, it's really easy, I feel, to lean on something that's really, really sweet. But something that doesn't have a lot of sweetness, it relies mostly on the other flavor components that are associated with it. And so when you mix them correctly, when you use the correct base spirits or um, components, you get something that really, really elevates everything together. And then you've got these other like secondary components, like your evolution of it, your aftertaste, your name other components i'm sure but like you don't really consider that like i think the big one of the big things for me is i hate anything that does that doesn't have a very good aftertaste and i don't realize something has a bad aftertaste until like it's in my mouth and it's there for the next hour or so and for the most part none of the cocktails this evening i think to the point of the sazerac where you kind of you sip it get to the sugar and then you're ready for the next cocktail i felt ready for the next cocktail because i don't think i'm tasting the sazerac anymore i certainly am not tasting the punch or whatever we had in the beginning general general burnside's, burnside's punch, punch. <laughs> like i'm not that was a very good drink it was, too. It was that really was a real, easy that was a really good drink to go from one cocktail to the next to the next where i feel like certain other streams when we're especially starting with something a little more sweet you have this lingering flavor of in particular the blue curacao down there the alcoholic one is a very potent aftertaste and i don't like it very much i think it's like uh decoyper or something like that oh De like, yeah De the that's, that's some shit is prolific <laughs> it sticks around and i don't want it to stick around but none of none of these ingredients here we've been using quality ingredients i think the, ent the entire stream so far we haven't used anything that is like aside from i get this is just a cheaper vermouth dry vermouth but like it's not it's not a cheap cheap vermouth oh yeah in terms of quality by any standard all right so before you drink this smell it like isn't it just that's just a pleasant smell yeah actually i'm picking up a little bit of the brine there yeah that's nice you get some of the brininess and yeah. then you take a sip of that it's so much better than the first one yep it's, it's so much yep. better than the first one yep yep it's not my favorite mm. spirit is gin and despite the fact that my favorite spirit is gin, I really don't know how to really break down gin. I don't know how to piece apart the different botanicals and stuff are in there. Yeah. However, the thing that gets me most about gin is just the sheer fact that like there's a there's an angle there, a botanicalness, a floweriness that like I just can't ignore. And it always goes well. I feel like it doesn't go bad with a lot of things. I had a question come up. Don saying what makes it so much better. So I'll I'll give I'll give my two cents. Go for so it. Yeah. I think there's two reasons why the two to one ratio for gin to vermouth is better than basically any other ratio. Uh, I think one the flavors are very balanced at that at that mixture. Yeah. Um, and you're you're tasting it more now and you're starting to see like we did two different garnishes basically with this this exact same drink but two mm -hmm. different garnishes they both taste crazy different but they are both very balanced. Oh yeah. Very yeah. very balanced. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. The, the other thing I was gonna say is, uh, when you mix a any when you mix any cocktail that is a spirit forward drink, but you dilute it with a lower spirit drink, that, but it's still meant to be like one of these stronger cocktails. So that was that was a lot of words. But basically, like <laughs> if if you make a weak martini, mm -hmm. it's not gonna taste as good as a stronger martini with the same ingredients. Yeah. 
Now, there is a other side of that spectrum where the you, kind of where the extreme it's, where it's side too where there's not enough of, let's say, the other yeah. components so of the non-strong one. That is, that's like the current day fad with mm -hmm. martinis is to do like vodka martinis with like a, a drop or two of vermouth. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that that's a, a very good embodiment yeah. of a martini. I mean, to be fair, it doesn't really do the martini much justice. I think I think my thought, my own two cents on this is that mm. the, the, the dry vermouth at least has, it has a slightly sweeter component to it. It's not sweet vermouth, so it's not super, it's not like, none of this is candy sweet, but it's not like, um... I'm having a hard time coming up with so like this. Here. So this this cocktail, the 50-50, mm -hmm. like uh, one and a half ounces of gin, one and a half ounces of vermouth, tastes like you're drinking wine yeah. with gin in it. Mm -hmm. This tastes like you're drinking a martini. Gin. Yeah. I'd say this tastes like you're drinking gin with a little bit of wine in it. Just yeah. enough that it really accentuates the proponents of the gin. I really like gin. So personally, this particular ratio where there's more gin compared to the vermouth is really, really vibing with me. I, again, I don't really have the vocabulary to properly describe now, I am, why it is that I like gin. Now, I, I, really, I am really curious. Like it. I am curious, Cam. I know you said on one of your previous streams you did a martini that was like a quarter ounce or a half ounce of vermouth. Yeah. Right? So the last, the last time, the first, the first time I had a Gibson, uh, it was just, was was on stream a few weeks ago. It was the casino cocktail stream. We had a Gibson, and the recipe that I found, I don't remember where it was from, used basically a five to one ratio of your gin to your vermouth. It was two and a half ounces. I don't know what the math works out there. It was seventy to maybe seventy five milliliters to like a half an ounce or about 15 milliliters of uh, the dry vermouth mm -hmm. there. And I liked it because I think the recipe also called for specifically a little bit of the onion brine. Mm. So I think to that point, there was a component of it that, that was you could essentially call a mixer that was allowing the rest of the perhaps more unbalanced components of the drink to lean on. Like I feel like you Yeah, can, that's almost like a dirty martini at that point, right? It, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's a dirty martini. Which not, would, not, which, a filth, not a filthy one. Which I would a dirty martini. Which I would, I would argue is a different drink. Yeah. Um but Yeah. But it was good. I think I think in general, you know, it speaking to the brine, it's it's salt. I love salt. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm I'm happily you, like, probably, you can put as much onion brine in there as you want to, and I'm still gonna be like if I can taste, taste the gin in there, I'm you okay probably with it. Like, uh, I don't think I tasted the vermouth at all in that cocktail. Well, now that I think right. about it, and like these, you definitely can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, and I, 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 I like vermouth. Some people don't like vermouth very much, mm -hmm. so I think that's why. Yeah, and even even my first impression of vermouth, like it was, it was very acidic. It was very, it was very it was vinegary, and that was because, like, you know, blame the brand, blame the packaging, blame the technique, whatever have you. I'm, it, this is still dry vermouth, and somehow it tastes better than it did the first time I tried it. Yeah, and that's a really, really cool aspect of it. Yeah. That's so good. out of out of the three you've had, so you've had five to one, you've had two mm -hmm. to one, and you've had one to one. What's your favorite ratio? I loved the five to one because it included the brine. To your point earlier, it was the when you have the cocktail onion in the drink, you don't actually have the brine itself. It has more of an evolution to it. It combines like the, the brine isn't there all the, at the beginning. Yeah, that's it good combines point. over time. I liked it because to be honest, that's it was it was a quick payoff. Yes. I really, really like that. And if you're in it for like the small thing and you want something to taste good real quick, that ratio, we, or regardless of the ratio, you add the onion brine, it's gonna taste pretty damn good every time. Aside from that, if I'm not in it for the long, for the for the short term, I'm in it for the for the long term. I really like the in general greater gin ratio to the vermouth because the vermouth, at least the Norley Pratt in this case, has a sweetness that just doesn't vibe with the with the with the gin i want it to be a little less laid back i want more of the gin than i do with the vermouth to be yeah. perfectly honest this is the more the, the cheap components expensive component and if you're going to make yourself a martini you have like let's say this particular combo here you probably want to taste more of the gin anyways yeah it's probably point. paid for more of it that's but a, that's like a really it's, good it's a nice it's a nice combo too and i think the two to one ratio at least for this particular combo here is an excellent way of serving it. I'm sure it's probably different for different gins out there. You, oh, yeah. I mean, you can make a martini with a London dry drip, gin. Yep. And I'm sure the ratio would probably work out a little bit differently. And Although then, actually, you, the the one that you made with the two to one ratio is you know, like your usual go-to. Do you usually do it with like a London dry, dry gin or? Yeah, yeah. I, I use beef eater usually mm. uh, Good when, one. I, when I make martinis, which is a little bit more juniper-y than this mm -hmm. one for sure. And then did you like, do you like the Gibson garnish better or the citrus garnish better? I'm gonna compare the two actually. 
I like Gibson Assault. I'm a sucker for Assault. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan. That's why I like the Gibsons a lot, too. I think they're fantastic. The orange right, has I'm, some interesting, really interesting bits, though, too. The, the orange bit, I'm going to call the orange one my favorite of the two, mm -hmm. because the orange component is something that, like, it's, it's unfamiliar, but it's approachable. It's not something that is so out there. I'm like, wow, this is, mm -hmm. I, I never want this Man, again. It's, good. it's, it's a good combo. These, so, these so, also I mean, are starting, I mean, they're also is, starting to warm up a little bit. Yeah. So they're this is also <laughs> coming from like good. a place of pride, like pride too. Like I know that I love salt. I know that if you add salt to anything, it's just going to taste better. And I, I don't want to say because it has the salt, I like it more. It's in a higher position than the orange. I want to say if I can sit on my high horse that I can taste the orange in the other combination, therefore it must be better than the easy saline onion. Yeah. But, no, I, I, I totally agree yeah. with you. That's so, succinctly, it's, it's more complex. And I, you know, even even as the past, what, what like 15, 20 minutes has been gone on, it's changed over time. Yeah. And it's evolved. And that's really I will also say martinis are a drink that you should drink kind of quick because they you need them to stay cold Yeah, if, it, if, it's, if it's warm, it's it's a completely different thing. So like even it, there's like kind of a race against time there Yeah, about like how quickly you should drink <laughs> a martini uh, You know if you're taking down the drinks quickly. Yeah, martinis are good. One. I think we uh, we covered all, quite a lot of we covered a lot of ground tonight. this time. We, well, let's see. We started in what year? Early uh, 1800s? We started in 1863 at 1863. the Battle of Fredericksburg in the Civil War. And we're at now, <laughs> Gibson's like 19, late, late, late 1900s? 1908. Okay, early 1908. So, okay, early 1908. so, so we covered about 50. Now. We covered about 50, 55, all, 60 All years. from the lens of a 2007, 2000, whatever the most recent copy of the book was, 15 yeah. or so, uh, perspective on it. Um, this has been a lot been a lot of ground that we covered here all in terms of like again this i don't know there's there's a certain like really cool component to be able to explore like the co the chronology of different cocktails yeah. and stuff and to and be able to compare specifically like the more like earlier ratio tastes to something a little more modern and yeah. I, i'll admit this is a more i don't know why i'm saying it but it, it feels like a more modern cocktail oh, than yeah. the punch that we had and maybe that's just an unfamiliarity with the flavor components yeah and i think uh i think it was interesting Familiar. taking the time to like do these like one after another because mm -hmm. you really did kind of see how it changed over time like yeah the, you, the punch obviously was like its own thing but then the improved cocktail was almost it almost like was kind of a bridge between the punches yeah. and like what we know as cocktails today because mm -hmm. it still had some of the similar components to it and it's so it's so cool like it's very like, interesting i've been taking a little bit more time like separate from streams i changed up the schedule a little bit to really like dive deeper into like the, the kind of theoretical and planning components of cocktails in general and i found that there's so many different articles out there that say like this cocktail came from this cocktail and that cocktail came from that one and so on and so forth and you get something that looks very very similar to the original and i think i have more tiki themed cocktails that are reminiscent in my memory but even still what we've explored now you had your um your cocktail that evolved into kind of like your sazerac and you have your old fashions and stuff that like you have these different classic cocktails and they're classic not in the sense that they are they, they're old they're classic in the sense that like they were building up to a point found the correct optimiz the, the optimized point and sat there right. and it's still the case even now in 2023 yeah and that's like really really appreciable and if you can appreciate like the the th those classic cocktails you know who, who knows what the future holds yeah right and i think um i think it was also interesting like going through the book and just kind of doing that stepwise process like you can see how tastes change too yeah so oh my like, gosh those first few cocktails were very sweet mm -hmm. and then these last couple have been not sweet very very short like, very like, 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 sa like sazerac and all these martini variants you don't like gin this the martini would just it suck yeah at least the way that we we've, we've constructed it well and frankly most people don't like martinis so they don't like gin i mean it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a gin drink or yeah. or you get a vodka martini like we were yeah. saying. i know like like anna is very particular against gin and i she, i don't know if I don't exactly know why, but well, I understand where she's coming. It's powerful from. flavored. It is, and, yeah. and then you look at the punches, like the, the punches. Uh, you can see why those aren't popular anymore because yes. they're so sweet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually, I, I'm a believer that punch could make a comeback because I think it's a cool drink. It I, is. I, I love I mean, the like, communal. So I think, like, so like we both, in, we, we're both in fraternities, and I yeah. feel like that whole jungle juice aspect of things is like very, very sweet, nowadays. like hiding the liquor and stuff, like your jungle juice yeah. or whatever. That's basically the ethicality of that is beyond the scope of this conversation. <laughs> but a punch, 
like by definition is going to have your spirit forward components combined with your sweeter components there and that's it's good yeah it's it's a really really good combo and it, it's it tastes awesome but like there's a there's a bit of a like a like a two sides of that there like it's not gonna because of the sweetness it's not not gonna taste awesome because of how sweet it is right. or like even to for like even going back to my discussion on the gibson it's got a lot of like saltiness to it it's mm. not not gonna be awesome we love the taste of salt unless you don't you mm. love the taste of sugar unless you don't so, but if you do and you're like most people you're just gonna like it just because it's sugar or you're salty i'm like it's taking me a lot of self-control not to finish these martinis because i love martinis oh so my gosh and, and whatever happens podcast. after the stream is uh yeah. it's, it's for our discussion <laughs> for our discussion only but um but um i think uh just to kind of to close our thoughts on this um if anybody else is interested in sort of where our cocktails that we have today came from mm -hmm. um and just like a really good read um, really, really would recommend uh, Imbibe. That's we. I promise we're not sponsored by these guys, but uh, if would, would if you say like that to, in, in general, <laughs> we're um, kind of recollections by David Wondrich is 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 worth the juice is worth the squeeze. Oh yeah. So this this book is a lot less of a recipe book and it's a lot more of a like read like like story yeah because i'll say like i mean like there there are so many prominent like cocktail creators out there you've got your educated bar fly you've got your cocktail chemistry you've got your how to drink and stuff and i feel like every single one of them has mentioned imbibe and punch and liquid intelligence or whatever but this particular book i've never looked at before this evening actually before a couple days ago when i was like yo i need we need some recipes for the stream that we're doing let's send me a couple of pictures of that i had no idea like the the content of this book and I'm starting to understand, even even through a very, very small lens, that this really is a book that if you sink your teeth into, you're gonna get the flavor that you're looking for. Yeah, for sure. So highly recommended. And uh, you know, I think this is something we probably we can revisit again because there's there's hundreds of cocktails. So in this many, book. so many there's cocktails. A lot. So there. we we try to we try to touch it's on It's almost like, intimidating. Yeah, we, we try to touch on ones from like each sort of uh, mm -hmm. era of the book, but yeah, we um, kind of got this whole like we've kind of got this like through. theming thing that oh, I've yeah. been trying to like put forth <laughs> here, and it's it's actually cool. Like I mean, they, aside from everything, like I I don't know if like you were aware of the whole like, yeah, theme that. thing here, but like it like the planning process. Eric did all the planning for this particular stream. He picked out all the cocktail recipes. I just source the ingredients all the planning and all the history and stuff was totally on eric's side so this was <laughs> this was cool it's, it was cool to do another one of these oh yeah always always fun to come on the stream always oh enjoy chatting with you guys it's always yeah. big fun all right man if you had to pick a favorite cocktail from this evening Ooh. is it is it your own gibson i mean i'd say um, that's probably a little biased there yeah the but... i mean i like gibsons i think i'm actually gonna go with the um improved cocktail mm -hmm. the, the improved version of the traditional cocktail from jerry thomas because yeah uh that surprised me. I did not think I was going to like that. I'm probably um, going to have to do the same thing. Yeah. I, w I was so surprised at like the, of, of the big players, flavor wise, that were in the drink. I, I they, they all just, they complemented each other. Yeah. And like, they usually mm -hmm. overpower every other drink you put them in the maraschino there, the, the um, yeah, and I've, I've had spirits the, otherwise. At the absinthe we put in there. The absinthe, oh, yeah. But the absinthe too. I, I think that drink had um, a really, strange combination of things mm -hmm. and I, i've had older versions of cocktails like that before and like i have never liked them so that one in particular was really good and i don't know if we just mixed it really well or what but it was serendipity i was, is I, was powerful yeah, I was surprisingly very very happy with that recipe and i would definitely make that again your joe was really good too that you made oh thank so you that yeah that's was... from that's from the tiki drinks book by weston and sharp that's yeah. where i got that recipe from but there's another more involved recipe in liquid intelligence by I'm forgetting David, David Arnold. Arnold. David Arnold. <laughs> I always keep forgetting. There's David Arnold, Jerry Thomas, and Jeffrey Morgenthaler, and David, David Wonderich. That I all 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 four of them. I can't quite them, distinguish between them all. It. <laughs> well, Jerry Thomas was born in the 1800s, so that's that's one way you can. That's one way you can distinguish, <laughs> right? In any case, y'all, we've covered multiple different cocktails this evening, all from David Wondrich's Imbibe. We covered the General Burnside's favorite. We covered the improved cocktail, also a little bit touching on the plain cocktail, the fancy cocktail, although we don't have the dry curacao, so we didn't get to cover that. We also had the Sazerac, as well as the Gibson, a cocktail that I've tried before, but we've seen it in a new light today. Pretty much everything you see here has all different ways of mixing it. There's a ton of history behind it, and, well... 
That's just the long and short of it. In any case, to everybody out there, this is probably where, this is where we're going to end things for now. Um, but it's it's always a pleasure having Eric on stream yeah, here. Yeah, always I big think fun. We are, we're two folks who come from various different backgrounds and stuff. And I think for the most part, it's it's really cool to kind of get together with different folks of different backgrounds to kind of see like where you're all coming from. And what I, I think Eric's mostly specialized in a lot of the various different classic cocktails and stuff and i just kind of got this wide berth of like uh lack of a better term jack of all trades of whatever is out there i know some folks who specialize in you know your tiki's your classics your um uh, amaro based drinks nightcaps and whatnot and just kind of be able to have the chance to really like explore that stuff so it's been cool so i appreciate it man absolutely it's been very good gold osborne says fire and there's a little paimon in the middle of it. That's what it's all about. This is really cool. So next week, I'll, I'll let you all now, for those who are sticking around to the very end, we do cocktails every Wednesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The end of the month gets a little bit weird. Um, my schedule has to change a little bit because Anna and I are doing some traveling. Um, pop in the Discord for recipes. The, we release our VODs as well that have all the recipes that we cover during the stream in the bottom of them. It's easy to copy and paste. You can take a screenshot of it, whatever. Um, but that's the most up-to-date place for stuff like that. Next week is Valentine's valentine's day kind of uh x-rated cocktails i will say nothing more on the matter there <laughs> eric it was a pleasure to have you on stream Absolutely today sir. as well thank you it's great a lot of great context and everybody out there no matter where you are i'm sure the moon is shining where you are and if that is the case have a wonderful rest of your night if the sun Thanks, is buddy. shining have a good morning to everybody cocktail hour happy hour twilight dawn otherwise good vibes y'all peace out y'all see ya bye